Congratulations on acquiring this Python course. We're going to be creating a lot of cool projects that are going to help you master the Python language. Of course, practice makes perfect. So I encourage you rather than just copying all the projects we're about to go through, that you actually try to edit them and that you try to build your own projects based on top of them. I will be including some homework at the end of each lesson, which can help you improve your skills and these are optional, of course, but I highly recommend that you follow that homework because you will learn most by actually practicing by yourself. In the next few lessons, I'm going to be showing you how to install Python and how to install PyCharm, the code editor that we will be using for this course. I also want to mention that this is not a dedicated Python course. I'm not going to be teaching you Python from scratch in this course, so it's very important you do have some sort of understanding of Python before you continue with this course, because this course is concentrating only on making lots of cool projects using the Python language. So you might learn a lot about Python along the way, but I'm not going to be teaching Python from scratch. I have another course that teaches you everything you need to know about Python in around 16 hours. So feel more than free to check that out. Otherwise, I'm very excited to have you for this course. So sit back, enjoy, and let's start coding. I think the biggest disability that we have as human beings is unbelief. Everything starts with a vision and the man without vision dies. For this course, you're going to want to have Python installed on your computer. And you can actually download it for free from python.org. And I will leave a link to this webpage in the resources section of this Udemy course. So you can just tap on that or you can just go to python.org. And inside here, you can go over to downloads. And what you're looking for is the latest release, which at this point is going to be Python 3.11. But this course is going to be compatible, of course, with Python 3.12 and 3.13 and so on. I'm going to regularly keep this course updated in case there are any breaking changes. But depending on whether you're on Mac OS or Windows, this is going to change. And you can even see right here, it's going to say view the full list of downloads. Then just tap on download and install Python. And then we can move on to installing a code editor. 99% of people have no future. So don't worry about it. Be positive, start to do it. And when people worry, open the door, see what are they worried about? and solve the problem. That's what I think. Now, there are actually a lot of options when it comes to using a code editor to develop Python applications. And my preference is PyCharm because it's very simple to use and it has full support for Python. You might have also heard of Visual Studio Code, which is also 100% free. And that has a lot of support for Python as well, but it's actually built for pretty much any kind of editing. It's a code editor, while PyCharm is a dedicated Python IDE. So in this course, I'm going to be using PyCharm. And if you want to easily follow along, I recommend you download PyCharm as well. Otherwise, everything we're creating can be written in Visual Studio Code or literally any other editor. Python does not really change based on where you are creating the code. It's just for the tools that I'm using PyCharm. But if you tap on download on this website, you're going to have a community and a professional edition. And of course, since we are learning Python, we're going to tap on the community edition, which is for pure Python development. Then you can select whatever kind of download file you want. I'm on Mac, so I get the .dmg for either Apple Intel or for Apple Silicon. And if you're on Windows, this will look slightly different. Or actually, there's a Windows tab here. It's going to look like that. And as soon as you open PyCharm, chances are your window is going to be slightly different because you don't have all these projects. But what you will have is a section that says new project. So tap on that. And inside here, name your first project, whatever you want. It can even be called first underscore project. And what you want to have selected is this new environment using the virtual environment. And something else you really want to make sure you have is the Python version that you are using. So here I have user local bin Python 3.11 selected. 
and that's the version I'll be using. You can also switch between Python versions. I also have 3.7 installed and 3.9 installed, but that doesn't matter in this case. So make sure you have Python 3.11. And just for fun, you can tap on create a main.py welcome script. And if you tap on create, it's going to create your very first project with a welcome script. And if you tap on run, it's going to print hi PyCharm in the console, which is quite cool and tells you that your project setup is working. Any nation that has made impressive progress has revered and practiced meritocracy, number one. Second, it has revered and practiced values. And third, it has in some way lived in peace with neighbors. One thing I should cover immediately before I program anything or before we create any projects in this course is the concept of ligatures, what those are and how we can use them and what they really do in our code. So to get started, I'll show you a simple example of a ligature when you are, let's say, printing a line of code or you're verifying that 10 is equal to 10, so you're doing some sort of comparison, you'll notice that what I wrote is going to be combined. So that's also valid for more than or equal to. You'll see that we're going to have this new symbol and that is the exact equivalent to having, let's say, more than or equal to. But when you use ligatures, it actually combines these symbols together. So more than or equals to is going to be turned into this symbol here. And the double equals is just going to look like a long single equals. It's supposed to make the program look more clean. There are quite a few programmers that don't like this, but I am not one of them. I actually love ligatures, so I'm going to be using them throughout this course. Another very common example of a ligature is when you're creating a function. Let's just call it def func and you say it returns something such as a string. One thing that confuses a lot of people is how did I make this arrow? Well, this arrow is literally the dash and the right angle bracket combined. So as soon as I combine these two, it turns into a ligature, which is this arrow. So you're going to see that a lot throughout this course. Just type it out as you would usually do. So if I type in, let's say dash arrow, it's going to turn into that. If I say more than or equals to, it's going to turn into that symbol and so on. And in case you like this crazy concept, let me show you how you can activate it and how you can deactivate it. So in PyCharm, go to settings and inside settings, tap or type in font. And it's going to take you to this font here, which is found under editor. And inside here, you'll see that there's a window called enable ligatures. And this has to be used with a font that is compatible. So here I'm using JetBrains Mono, JetBrains Mono, and that is compatible with ligatures. And you can see a preview down here of those ligatures. So if we disable that, you'll see all the symbols that turned into ligatures just bare. So pay close attention to these symbols here. When we enable the ligatures, you'll see that a lot of these symbols combine. So just make sure you're using a font that supports this and that you have this box enabled if you want to use ligatures and then tap on OK and you can start using ligatures just like me. So 10 is more than or equal to 10. And it's going to look like that. There's actually one more thing I want to bring up before we continue with this course and that is where you can find all the projects. In this course, I am going to leave a link in the description to the source code for the projects for each one of the lessons. And the source code is going to be grouped together. So I'm going to leave the link in this video right here. And anytime you want to find the source code for a certain project, just tap on that link because it's going to contain all the source codes for this entire course. So when you tap on the link, it's going to take you to a GitHub repository. Right now it's quite empty because I'm building this course as we speak, but what you're going to see is probably a lot of folders that say project one to 10, projects 11 to 20, projects so on and so forth. And if you tap on that, you'll see that it's going to contain the projects. 
So for example, if you want to look at the source code for a number guessing game, you can tap on that and you'll find all the source code inside here. Otherwise, we have the dice simulator inside here as well. So this is where I'm going to be sharing the source code and I'm going to keep updating it regularly in case there are any breaking changes in the near future. So everything should work smoothly. So in case you want to get the source code for any given project, just make your way to this GitHub repository and scroll through the projects because there's going to be a lot of projects here for you to play around with. And all you have to do is copy and paste it and change a few values to see how the project actually works in case you get lost at any point, of course. But with all that being said, it's finally time for us to get started with coding some cool projects. I enjoy doing them, but more than that, actually, let me rephrase it. I think the reason why I enjoy it so much is because how much the people get off the audience appreciates what we do. You know, there's a lot of things I could be doing outside of the industry, even within the industry, but you know, I don't know if the satisfaction would be the same. You know, because to be a part of something that people really appreciate, as much as maybe certain people hate to admit it, it's it's important to us. You know, as humans, it's like you want to believe that you know what you're putting out there and what you've dedicated so much time to is, is it, there's a certain degree of acknowledgement and more than acknowledgement and appreciation. You know, obviously this one's been appreciated for a long time. And that's a, that's a great feeling. For this project, we're going to be creating some Mad Libs, which is a story based project which relies on user input to create some very funny stories. So it's going to look like this. First, it will ask us to enter a noun and then a verb. We can type in code, then a noun again. We can type in Bob and finally another verb, which will be uh, hide. Then it's going to generate a story for us, such as once upon a time, there was a banana who loved to code all day. One day, Bob walked into the room and caught the banana in the act. Bob, what are you doing? I'm just coding. What's the big deal? Well, it's not every day that you see a banana coding in the middle of the day. I guess you're right. Maybe I should take a break. That's probably a good idea. Why don't we go hide instead? Sure, that sounds like fun. And so... Bob and the banana went off to hide and had a great time. The end. So as you can see, it puts our words into a fun story. But let's get started immediately with creating this project. So first, we're going to create a function called get input. And it's going to take a word type of type string. Then inside here, we're going to get the user input. So the user input of type string is going to equal input and here we want to get a formatted string and say enter a word type. So we don't have to type in enter a noun, enter a verb over and over and over. We want to save time in doing that. Then we're going to return the user input. Now with this, we can actually get the user input. We can type in noun one is equal to get input and the word type, which is going to be a noun for the first one. Then we can tap that again and get verb one. I want to change this to verb. Then we get noun two, and that's going to be a noun again. And finally, verb two. And you can add adjectives and other kind of word types. But for this simple example, we're just going to add verbs and nouns. So this was actually supposed to be noun. I don't know what I wrote there. And verb. So now we have the inputs. And we just need a story to put these inputs into. So here we can type in story and we're going to create a multi line story because it's really hard to write everything on one line. As you might imagine, it's going to go all the way out of the screen. So we're going to use a multi line string. So inside here, we can start with our story. We can say once upon a time, there was a noun one. And that will insert our noun into that string who loved to verb. And I want that to be verb one, actually. So let's refract to that verb one who loved to verb one all day. And as you can see, that is the concept behind Mad Libs. We are creating the story, but we're not immediately writing the information inside, such as the verb and the nouns. And as I said earlier, you can add an adjective. So we can type an adjective, let's say one is going to equal get input and we're going to add the adjective. So with that, we can add the adjective in front of the noun. We can say adjective. And now we have an adjective and a noun inside this string. 
Now for the rest of the story, I'm going to copy and paste that in because it's really redundant to write that all out in front of you. As you can see, you just add a line and you continue writing your story. And at the end, we just need to remember to print the story once we're done adding all the information. So once we run this, we can add everything that we added earlier. We can say banana and then for adjective, we can type in epic. For verb, we can say uh, code again. Another noun is going to be James this time. And the last verb is going to be hide again. So now we have once upon a time, there was a epic banana who loved to code all day. And then the rest of the story is the same. So that was just a fun game that you could create in Python. It's very simple. It's a very good starter project. And I recommend you create your own stories. And also instead of adding stuff such as verbing, which will often get it wrong, I would recommend adding something such as verb plus, let's say, present tense, so that the user knows which tense to insert because actually trying to get the correct tense correct with this is almost impossible. So as a homework project, create your own Mad Libs project and please share it in the comment section down below of this course. India is a country that definitely is not easy to understand. There's many sides to her. She's beautiful, unpredictable and scary at times. India has taught me that we should appreciate diversity, that we should be kind to one another and that in the end, we should keep our friends and family close to our hearts. For this Python project, we're going to be creating a number guessing game. And the first thing that's going to happen is that it's going to print to the console to guess the number in the range from whatever we specify, which in this example is going to be one to 10. Next, we can start playing the game. We can say 10, the number is going to be lower. We can say six, it's even lower than that. So let's try three. And I'm guessing it's going to be four by that point. And it's also going to handle errors. Like what if the user types in hello, the program is going to be able to say, hey, you are not playing the game correctly please enter a valid number. So it's another really good project for getting started with Python. And we can get started with this immediately. So create a new Python file. And we're going to start by importing a random number function. So from random imports random integer, then we can start with the basic setup. So first we want to specify a lower number and a higher number, and that's going to equal one and 10. And if you want the game to be more complex, of course, you can add higher numbers. I think one to 10 is sufficient because guessing is a difficult sport. But next we can get a random number or we can actually create this, which is going to be of type integer. And we're going to call random integer. And we're going to insert the lower bound, which is the lower number and the higher number. So it's going to generate a number between one and 10, 10 inclusive. Next, we want to print to the user the numbers that they have to guess. So guess the number in the range from lower number to higher number. And that will take care of the setup. We can now create a infinite loop by typing in while true. And while true, we're going to try to get some user input. And this is used to make sure that we can handle any errors that occur while we're trying to get the user input because in programming, one of the most dangerous fields or one of the most complex fields is handling user input. Users will put whatever they want. It's just how it works. There's no getting around that. Even with the best instructions in the world, you'll still find users trying to do something silly. So we need to be able to handle that. And we're going to do that by creating a try and accept block. So try to get the user guess, which is going to be of type integer and we're going to get an input, which is going to say guess with a colon. And you're going to get this syntax highlighting because we are getting a string back and that's what input gives us back. So we need to insert integer here with parentheses to pass that to an integer. And that's why we're putting it in a try and accept block because if you put some words in here and you try to turn it into an integer, it's going to raise an exception. So now that we have that, we can accept the value error because that's the only error we can get in this case as E. And value error just means that we're trying to put text in where we should be trying to put a number in. 
and he will type in please enter a valid number and we need to type in continue and continue just says that once we run into this we should not execute any code under it should continue with the while loop so this line will take us straight to the while true now we can actually create the logic that checks for the numbers so here we can type in if user guess is more than the random number that we generated then we're going to print that the number is lower so the user can guess a lower number if or elif the user guess is less than the random number we're going to print that the number is higher else we're going to print that the user guessed the number you guessed it and we're going to break out of this loop because we don't want to continue guessing once we guess the number we want to tell the program that okay we did what we had to do now break out of this while loop so we can finish the program so that we can make it to line 22 or 21 and since there's nothing there it's going to finish running the script so that was all the code you needed to make this work now if we run the program it's going to ask us to guess the number in the range from 1 to 10 we can start with something such as hello and it's going to ask us to please enter a valid number so we'll try seven this time the number is higher we can put eight higher nine and we've guessed it the number was nine so it's a very simple game but there's a lot you can do with it as a homework project try to add a limit to the amount of guesses a user can use so maybe the user can only use three guesses to get the number or else game over that is the homework project i definitely recommend you do these kind of homework projects because they will help you master the language faster what are your thoughts on the metaverse which like takes technology to the next level and puts us in like a virtual like what's your view on that maybe we're in the metaverse right now <laughs> <laughs> it's like we're like you know when i grew up it was like don't sit too close to tv it's gonna ruin your eyesight right. and now we got like tv is like literally right here <laughs> I'm like, uh, what? <laughs> Is that good for you? <laughs> With VR goggles, you get motion sickness. It's like weird. Let's build a dice rolling simulator in Python. The project is going to look like this. We're going to have a prompt that says, how many dice would you like to roll? Here we can enter numbers such as one, and it will give us the result of that roll. We can also enter numbers such as three, and it's going to give us three results of three different dice rolls. So we're effectively using a dice simulator. We can even say give us 10 rolls and it's going to give us 10 different dice rolls back. So it's a very simple program that you can use when you're playing some sort of board game or when you're creating your very own game in Python. And finally, if we want to exit, we can tap on exit and it's going to end the program for us with a very nice message that says thanks for playing. So it's a friendly message that the user will be happy to see. But let's jump right into writing the code. So the very first thing we want to do is import random. And random contains some functionality that helps us generate random numbers. Then we're going to create a function called roll dice. And we're going to create a parameter called amount, which is going to be of type integer. And initially it's going to be set to two. So if the user doesn't specify anything, it's going to roll two dice anyway. And it's going to return to us a list of integer because we want to get those values back in a list and we want to make sure that they are integers. So the very first thing we need to do is check whether the amount is less than zero, less than or equal to zero. Because if the user types zero, that's quite ridiculous. You can't roll zero dice or at least not to my understanding. So we're going to say that if it's less than or equal to zero, we're going to raise a value error. We're going to tell the program, okay, the user is doing something funky. We need to handle this value error. And we're going to handle this later in the program. But anyways, if the user types zero or less than zero, we're going to raise that error. Next, we're going to define some rules, which is going to be a list of type integer. So we can store those rules, but first, we need to, of course, create this list to store the roles. Now, for i in range of the amount that the user has defined, we're going to create a random role. So the random role of type integer is going to equal random dot random integer. And that's going to be from one to six. So each time we go through this loop, it's going to throw a die, or it's actually going to generate a number between one and six. So that's going to simulate 
throwing a die. And next we can type in rolls.append because we want to append that number. So append random roll. And finally, at the bottom, once we're done doing all of that, we just want to return the rolls. So that's our main function. This is the function that's going to roll all of the dice for us. Next, we're going to create a main function. So def main, and we're going to insert our main functionality here. So we want our program to be in an infinite loop. And to do that, we'll type in while true. And while we are in this infinite loop, we're going to try the following. We're going to type in user input of type string is equal to the input and we need to provide a prompt. And I'll actually make some more space. And this prompt is going to say how many dice would you like to roll. But we also want to check that the user doesn't want to exit the program because if the user types in exit, we want to make sure they can exit it without being stuck in this infinite loop. So if user input dot lower, because we want to make sure that whatever the user types gets put down to a lower case, because right now the user can type in something such as exit and the program's not going to know what that means when we actually want the user to type in exit. So we're going to say if user input dot lower is equal to exit, then we're going to do the following. So we don't have to worry about the user typing in uppercase exit and that just ensures that we handle this properly. So let's remove that and let's take care of this exit. So here we'll type in thanks for playing and we will break out of the while loop. Now, while we're still inside this try block, we need to try to pass the user input to an integer. And that pretty much means all we have to type in is int of user input. So we're not really doing anything at the moment. We just converted that user input to an integer but we also want to roll the user input because the user input is actually the amount of dice we are rolling. So inside this, we can say roll dice. So now we're rolling the dice of the integer of user input. And we also want to print this. So once again, you can highlight everything and by holding shift and your parentheses, it's going to place parentheses around it. And we're going to print this. So this line of code will actually print the result to the user. And as it is, it's going to return to us a list. But we are missing the accept block, which is going to raise a value error if we do something wrong. And by something wrong, I mean what happens if the user types in, let's say, A or potato or banana or types in something that's not a number. That's going to raise a value error. As you can see, inappropriate argument value, but it's of the correct type. So. Here we're going to print in parentheses, please enter a valid number. So now no matter what happens in the try block, if something goes wrong and it's a value error that actually caused it, we're going to get this executed. And the same thing's going to go with our roll dice function. If the amount is less than zero, we'll get this value error. And finally, with that being done, we can type in if name is equal to main to make sure we're executing the code in the correct script and we can insert our main function. And with that, we can actually test the program by tapping on this green arrow. And here we can say we want to roll three and you'll get three results back. Otherwise you can say six and we'll get six results back. But if you type in zero, it's going to say, please enter a valid number. If you say potato, it will also ask you to provide a random or no, a valid number. Otherwise, if we do, let's say two, we'll get one and six. If we tap and do nothing, it's not going to give us anything. It's going to tell us to still enter a random number. So our program is working as it should. There's only one thing that we can do to improve it and that is remove these brackets because right now it's quite an ugly user experience if we still have those brackets. So what I'm going to do here is add an asterisk in front of roll dice. And you can put this in front of any list and it's going to unpack it. It means it's going to take out the values from that. And with that being put into place, we're going to add a separator, which is going to be this comma space. So this is part of the print function. It is an argument that just provides a separator for each one of the elements. And this asterisk here is going to unpack the list that we have. 
So the next time we actually run this, we can say we want four numbers back and it's going to unpack them and place a comma in between each one of them. So that looks much nicer to the user. It doesn't have these weird brackets that a lot of people don't even know about. So let's also type in 10 or we can also type in 100 and it's going to generate as many dice rolls as we want. Now, as a personal challenge, I want you to try to get the total sum of the dice rolls and display it to the user every time they roll the dice. And that means pretty much that if the user says, okay, I want three dice rolls, and that brings you back three, two, and let's say four, it should also show the total. So we want to have something such as, let's say nine as the total, so that the user can easily understand what the total sum of all the values are, and that will provide them a nicer user experience. So that's your challenge for this lesson, because again, if they insert three and they get these numbers back, it's quite cool that you get those rules, but a total following that would be so much nicer. Yeah, culturally, na, bahut rich hai Bharat. Bahut, matlab, bahut zada. Sometimes I also feel, mujhe na bahut acha lagta hai. I, there's no place I want to be except India. I'm very proud to be born in India and to be born in this culture. Kisi bhi hisse mein chale jao na, har jagah ek alag hi culture hai. The beauty, the architect, the food, it's so amazing. I, I, main kahi aur settle nahi ho sakti hu. In this lesson, we're going to be creating a script which is going to allow us to play Hankman. So it's going to look like this if we tap on run. We're going to get a prompt in our console that asks for our name. Here, I'm going to enter Federico because that is my name. And it's going to say, welcome to Hangman Federico. Now we have a word to guess and we can guess by entering a letter. I'm going to put B. And since that was wrong, it's going to say we have two tries remaining. Then I'm going to try S and it's going to place it there if there is an S, of course. If there's no S, it's going to say we have another wrong guess. So we can say, for example, Z, it's going to say, sorry, that was wrong, one try remaining. Now, if we tap in something such as E and we put C and maybe even an R and we slowly start to guess the word, you'll see it's going to slowly fill out. Now, it's only missing one letter, so we'll add T and the word was secret. So it's a very simple version of Hangman. And if we got that wrong, it will tell us that we lost. And just to show you, let's type in my name again. And here we'll tap in, let's say one, two, three, and we'll say no more tries remaining, you lose. So that's what we will be creating in this lesson. And to get started, we're going to import from random the choice function. And I'll show you what that does as soon as we create our program. Now, our entire program is going to have one function, which is called run game. Just to keep this simple, we're going to leave it inside this function. And first of all, we need to create a word to guess. So here we have a word of type string, and that's going to equal choice. And inside choice, we need to include a list of words. So one word is going to be apple, one word is going to be secret, and one word is going to be banana. Ideally, you want to pass in a list of random words that you want the user to guess. The more words you have, the more spicy your program is going to be. Choice just picks a random element from the list and returns it and assigns it to word. So it's a very simple way to pick a random element. Next, we want to give the user a friendly welcome message. So username of type string is going to equal input of what is your name. And that will allow us to enter a username. Then we want to print welcome to hangman, comma, and we will pass in the username. Next, we have some basic setup. So I'm going to write a comment called setup. And here we're going to create a variable called guest, which is going to contain a string. And right now it's an empty string, but each time we guess a letter, it's going to fill up with the letter that we guessed so we can keep track of the letters that we are using. So that's the goal of this variable. And under that, we're going to add tries of type integer, which is going to be equal to three because we want the user to only have three tries. 
Otherwise, you can put 5 or you can put 10, depending on how hard you want your game to be. I think 3 is a pretty cool or a pretty difficult setting, so I'm going to leave it there. Next, let's create the actual game. So here we'll type in while tries is more than 3, because once we're out of tries, we want the game to finish, of course. We're going to do the following. So first, we're going to create a variable called blinks of type integer, which is going to equal 0. And blinks are just those blank underscores that are where the letters are supposed to be. So first of all, we're going to print, and before I print, I'll make some space. So we're going to print, let's say, the word with a space, and it's going to have an end line of nothing. So this is just going to be the starting point. This is the word we are guessing. Now, for each character or for each letter in the word, we're going to check if the character is in the guessed sequence, which is this over here. So if it's inside there, we're going to print that character. So character with an end line that is nothing, because by default, Python provides a new line at the end of each print statement. But we want our print statements to combine themselves. So we're going to add nothing as an end. Then we can say else print underscore. So if there's a letter that is not in our guess, we're just going to put an underscore so we can try to guess it again. So here we'll type in end equals empty quotation marks again. And we want to say blanks plus equals one. The reason we're keeping track of blanks is because when there are no blanks left, the user has won the game. So we just want to make sure that there are no blanks left eventually. Now, it's also a good idea right here to create an empty print statement just because we want some space. And that's all this print statement is going to do. It's going to provide a blank line. So you can even add a comment if you prefer saying what this does. So adds a blank line. And I highly recommend you add a comment like this when you're adding a print statement without any information because this code does not really explain anything, but we still want it to format our script. So let's move on to checking whether the user has won the game. So if blanks is equal to zero, that means that there are no letters to guess anymore, which means the word has been completed. And that also means that the user has guessed the word. You got it. And we need to break out of this while loop because the game is over and we do not need to loop anymore. Now, both of these should be inside the while loop. So I'm going to tap on tab so they actually get inside this while loop. Next, we want to create our guess. We want to get the user input for that guess. So here we'll type in input and we'll type in enter a letter. Once we have that letter, we can check if the guess is in the guessed letters then we're going to do the following. We're going to print that you already used and we're going to print that guess. So guess, please try with another letter because we want to be kind to the user. And if they guess the same letter twice, we don't want to punish them for that. Of course, you can change that if you want. If you want your program to be much more unforgiving, just remove this line. Otherwise, this is a forgiving check. And if we made it that far, we can now append to guest the guess. So if we guess A, it's going to add A to guest. If we then say B, guest is now going to equal AB. So it's going to contain the guesses in a string. Now, next, we should check if the guess is not in the word, then we're going to say tries minus equals one because it is a bad guess. And we can even print that, sorry, that was wrong. And we will add the tries. So tries, tries remaining. So it will tell the user how many tries they have left. And of course, if the tries is equal to zero, then it is a game over because the user has no tries remaining. So here we can print no more tries remaining, you lose. And we're going to break out of this while loop because there's no point in continuing the game if the user has lost. But outside of this while loop, we can now type in if name is equal to main 
or in PyCharm, you can just type in main and it's going to create that check. And if that's the case, we're going to run the game. So with that being done, we now have all the code we need to play Hangman. And I'm going to tap on run. So first we should enter our name, which is going to be Federico. And it's going to say, welcome to Hangman Federico. But there was a problem here and the code prematurely finished. So the problem in our script was that we were checking that tries was more than three and we initially set this to three. This was supposed to be zero because we're checking that there are more tries than zero remaining. Of course, if we have three here, this is never going to be true. So this line of code will be skipped. But now that I fixed that, we can rerun the program. And here I can type in my name. And finally, we can play the game. So I'm going to try with a B. That was wrong. I'm going to try with an S. And we finally have a letter Then we can add T. And at this point, we kind of know what it is. So we can type in the whole word and it's going to say you got it. So we have a very simple version of Hangman here, but we have one more problem with our script, which makes it very easy to cheat. And I'm going to leave this as a homework problem for you to figure out, because again, the best way to master Python is to practice. So let me show you right now what the problem is. Right now we have this game. We say our name is our name, but look what happens when I type in A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. We have this glitch that we made one guess and we have two tries remaining because of course a lot of these letters are wrong, but we also guessed it because we inserted letters that were part of the word. So at the end, we also won the game. So that's a major speed run for this program. So your homework is to create a way of checking that the user is not trying to cheat like this. Make it so that the user can only insert one letter at a time or that they can insert the full word and guess it to get full points without having to guess one letter at a time. I was different. Um, I still am different. I'm in a country which is very far, far away from home, um, very far away from familiarity. And I think that's what my strengths are. When I was young, I didn't understand that. When I was a kid in school, when I was being bullied, when I didn't understand who I was turning into. But what makes you different if you identify that and you realize that, all right, this is what's different about me. If you think about it, that's exactly what makes you special. That's exactly what makes you unique. And you need to just, and I did that over time, um, be the best version of yourself because the more different you are, the more special you are. It's finally time we create one of the greatest games of all time. That's right, we're going to create rock, paper, scissors. So if we run this program, we're going to get a welcome message that says, welcome to RPS 9000. So all we have to do is enter rock, paper or scissors. In this case, I'm going to type in scissors and it's a tie because the AI also picked scissors. But let's try to do rock next. And I beat the AI. And then we can try again, we can say paper. And looks like I win again. So right now I'm on a good streak. And what happens if I tap in paper again? So now we're playing rock, paper, scissors over and over with some cool graphics in the console. And that's exactly what we're going to make in this video. And we can also exit as always, and the computer will be friendly to us and tell us thanks for playing. So with all that being done, let's jump into the logic behind this game. To get started, we're going to import random and we're going to import system. So we can use some of these system features. Next, we're going to create a class called RPS, which stands for rock, paper, scissors. And we're creating a class because I want to define some state and for me, using a class was the easiest way to do this. So first let's create an initializer and the initializer will take care of giving an intro screen and initializing some attributes. So here we can type in welcome to RPS 9000 exclamation mark. Then we need to create those attributes. So self dot moves of type dictionary. And this is going to contain our dictionary of moves which means of course we have rock, paper and scissors. 
And this is actually where I inserted my emojis. So here we can type in rock and you're going to have to search online for these emojis. On MacBooks, you can just tap on the FN key two times to get this emoji keyboard. So here I can search for rock and I'll just insert this rock there and I'll have a rock in my dictionary. Then we're going to have something that is paper and that's going to be, of course, the paper that you have to put inside here. So find an emoji for paper and scissors, which will also have an emoji for scissors. So for that, you're going to have to go online to actually get those emojis. For me, I have it in my keyboard, so I can just do that and find paper. And I'm going to use this weird parchment. And for scissors, I'm going to do the same thing. So scissors and we're going to use these ones. Then we need to also define the valid moves so that the user doesn't type in something random. And this just makes it easier for our program to understand what to do. So valid moves is equal to, or is actually of type list of string to be more explicit. And that's going to equal a list of self dot moves keys. So we're creating a list from this dictionary over here and we want this list to contain the keys, which means rock, paper, and scissors. So those are the only valid moves. Now for this project, we need to create three methods. One is going to be for playing the game. So we're going to call that play game. And for now we're going to add an ellipsis, which can be used to pass. Then we're going to have a function called display moves. And I'm going to add a Y there and we're also going to pass for now. Then we're going to have a method that checks the moves to see whether we won or lost. So check move, and we're going to pass for now as well. So those are the three methods for our class, but we're going to take care of the very first one, which is play game. And first we need to get a user move. So whether we want to throw rock, paper, or scissors, we need to get that user input from the user. So here we'll type in input rock, paper or scissors. And we'll add that to show that the user can input some user input. And we're going to lower that because if the user of course types in something such as rock with a capital R, we want to make sure that our program can understand it because Python is case sensitive. So rock should turn into rock and rock can be compared with this rock over here. So that's what lower is going to help us to achieve. And the very first thing we want to check is if the user move is equal to exit. We don't want the user to play a game they don't want to play. So we're going to give them the option to exit. So here we can type in thanks for playing exclamation mark. And here we're going to type in system dot exit. And that's going to exit out of the program. So it's kind of like a premature ending for our script. Next. Under that if check, we're going to check if user move is not in self dot valid moves, then we're going to print invalid move. And we're going to do something a bit funky here. We're going to return self dot play game, which means we're actually going into a recursive loop. If they try to make a move that doesn't exist, it's just going to go to the top of this function, kind of like a while loop, and it's going to get some new user input so that we can try again. Below that, we need to get the AI move. So we're going to call it AI move of type string. And that's going to equal random dot choice. And in here, we can get the self dot valid moves. So it's going to pick a random move from this list. And that means the AI can pick either rock, paper, or scissors. Below that, we have two more methods. And we're actually going to be using these methods down here. So first we need to display the moves to the user. So we'll type in display moves. And this is going to take a user move and a AI move, which we're going to add, of course, to these methods as soon as we're done. And we need to check the moves. So self dot user move and the AI move. So we're going to pass those inside these methods so that we can check whether the moves were correct and we can display them. So first of all, let's take care of displaying the moves. Here we'll type in that we need a user move of type string and an AI move of type string. And you can just copy these immediately and place them in check move because they're going to take the same arguments. 
But for display moves, let's get started with formatting. So first I'm going to display some lines to kind of create a divider. Then we're going to print F U and the result, which is going to be self dot moves at the index of user move. And if you recall, self dot moves is a dictionary. So if we place in rock, it's going to replace it with this rock. If we place in paper, it's going to replace it with this paper. We're accessing the value with the key. Next, you can duplicate that. And here we can say AI. So now we get self dot moves and we're going to place inside the AI move. Then all that's left for us to do is to close this with some more dashes to create another divider. So this is going to show us what happened and the moves that were thrown. So if I throw paper, it's going to say you threw paper and the AI is going to throw whatever they decide to throw. Now the trickiest part is of course the logic of rock, paper, scissors, but it's going to look like this. So if user move is equal to the AI move, so if we both throw paper or we both throw rock, of course, we're going to print that it's a tie. Otherwise we need to handle the other scenarios. So else if the user move or L if the user move is equal to rock and the AI move is equal to scissors, we're going to print that we won. So you win. L if user move is equal to scissors and the AI move is equal to paper, we're also going to print that we win. So you win. L if user move is equal to paper and the AI move is equal to rock, we still win. So we can type in print you win. Else the AI wins because these are the only scenarios where we can win. So everything else is going to be the AI that wins. So here we can print AI wins. So that is the class and the functionality that we need to make this rock, paper, scissors game. Now we can go to the bottom as always, create our if name is equal to main check, and we need to first create an instance of our game. So RPS is going to equal RPS. And finally, all we have to do now is type in while true, because we want to play the game many times. And we're going to type RPS play game. With that all being written, we can run the script. And if everything goes well, we should get the same question as from earlier, rock, paper, or scissors. First, I'm going to type in something such as this large number, but that's an invalid move. So we can also say something such as rock. And finally, we can see that we get our displayed message and the result of what just happened. Then we can play again, we can say paper, and it looks like I won. Then we can say paper again. It's a tie, if I say paper again, this time I lost, so AI wins. So there we have it. We just created a rock, paper, scissors game. And as a personal challenge, I invite you to try adding a scoring system to this game because it might be fun to see how many times the AI won or how many times you won. So that's just a quick challenge if you have the time. Otherwise, let's move on to the next project. What's incredible is in five seconds flat, self-doubt can take over and rob you of your power and rob you of joy and rob you of, of your potential. Or in five seconds flat, you can actually use one stupid little trick to push yourself to grab it. In this lesson, we're going to be building a random password generator and it's going to be very secure. So the program is going to look like this. As soon as we run the script, we're going to get five random passwords back. And it's also going to inform us whether it has uppercase characters and special symbols so that if we have those requirements, we can make sure that those are inside our password. And this is going to be highly customizable. So you can pick the password length, whether you want it to include symbols and whether you want it to include uppercase characters. So we can make them as long as we want. We can even make a 30 character password. And as you can see, we'll have these huge passwords that are extremely secure. This is something that a lot of people would have a very hard time trying to guess. Even if they made a billion guesses, this is going to be really hard to guess. 
So that's the program that we're going to be making. And to get started, we're going to import two different modules. One is the string module and one is the secrets module. Because in Python, you might be aware that we have a random module, which is good for generating random numbers. But that is not a secure way of generating numbers. It can be, it can theoretically be reverse engineered. So we use secrets to actually generate real secure random numbers. But uh, the first thing we need to do is create some checks and we're going to get this out of the way first. So first we're going to create a function called contains upper to check whether a password contains an uppercase character, at least one. And it's going to return to us a Boolean. So it's either going to return true or false based on whether it contains an uppercase character. So for a character in password, we will type in if the character is upper or not is upper, but literally is upper, we're going to return true. So as soon as it finds an uppercase character in our string or in our password, it's going to return true. Otherwise, if it finds nothing, it's going to return false. So it contains no uppercase characters. And we're going to do something very similar for the symbols. So just copy and paste that. And we're going to type in contains symbols. And this time to actually check, we're going to check if the characters in string dot punctuation. So we're going to be using this string module to import some punctuation. And I can actually show you what's inside that right now. If we print, let's say string dot punctuation and we run this script, you'll see that we will get all of these symbols back. So string just makes it simple for us to use these characters. It also has ashy characters. So if we type in string dot, let's say ashy lowercase, you'll see that we'll get the whole alphabet back. And that's just much more convenient than typing in A, B, C, D, E, F, G and all the symbols you want. So I highly recommend you use string to just save some time. But next we can create a function called generate password. And this is going to take a few arguments. And the first one is going to be the length of type integer. How long do you want that password to be? Whether it includes symbols of type Boolean and whether it should include uppercase which will also be of type Boolean. And that's going to return to us a string. Now, first we need to create the combination of characters that we want to use. So combination of type string is going to equal string dot ashy lowercase plus string dot digits, because we want to use both numbers and the alphabet in our password. So this is going to print out the alphabet plus the numbers zero to nine. So that's going to be the combination of characters we want to use. But of course, what happens if we want to use symbols or if we want to use uppercase characters? Well, we need to include some checks. So if symbols, we're going to say combination plus equals string dot punctuation. So we're going to add that to our combination string so we can use the punctuation. And the same thing is going to happen for uppercase. So if uppercase is true, we can just append to combination plus equals string dot ashy uppercase. Next, we need to get the combination length of all the characters we are using so that we can use it in our random sequence. And I'll show you later what I mean by that. But for now, we just need to get the length of the combination. Then we can type in new password because this will be the password we will generate. And that's going to be an empty string initially. Now for underscore in range of length, we're going to do the following. We're going to append to the new password. So new password plus equals combination. And then we need to open some square brackets. And here we can call secrets random below. And the way random below works is that you specify a number and it's going to generate random numbers until that number. So if you generate 10, or if you insert 10, it's going to generate numbers between zero and 10. So we want to make sure that we generate numbers until the combination length. So we don't get an out of index error because the combination length is going to be the total amount of characters in this string. So if we have 10 characters in this string, it's only going to try to access numbers up to 10. And if we didn't have that, we might make a mistake and it might try to access a 11th character. But if that doesn't exist, we're going to raise or we're going to get an exception. 
But as soon as we have that, we can return the new password. And that will conclude our generate password function. And the last thing to do is actually just to use it. So we can say if name is equal to main. And here we can type in that the new password, or I'm just going to call it new pass here of type string is going to equal generate password. And let's just test it out. Right here we have a length of 10. And I'm going to say symbols should be set to true and the uppercase should be set to false. We don't really care about uppercase characters and we're going to print this new password. Now, if we run the script, we should get some silly new password such as that. That's extremely secure. We can run it again and again and again, and you'll see that we will continuously get random passwords. In case you don't want symbols, set that to false and you should only get digits and letters now. But what I showed you before was a bit different. So let's try to recreate what I showed you earlier. So for I in range, let's say one, two, six. So we generate five new passwords. We're going to do the following. We have the new pass, which is perfectly fine, but we also want to add some specifications. And this is just to show to the user. So we're going to format this string. And the first thing we're going to insert is U for uppercase to tell the user whether the string contains uppercase. So here we can just insert contains upper and insert the new pass. And the same thing will go for the symbols. So uppercase S curly brackets contains symbols and we will enter the new password. Now the last thing to do is to modify our print statement a bit. So F quotation marks, we will insert an I an arrow mark and we will say, okay, here's the new pass and the specifications, which will be placed inside parentheses. So here we have these specifications. Now it's going to generate for us five different passwords. And it's also going to tell us whether we have any specifications. So right now, all of these are just alphanumeric, which means we have the alphabet and digits, but we don't have any uppercase and we don't have any symbols. But let's set symbols to true. And these will all contain symbols now, or they should contain symbols. And we will also set uppercase to true. And we will get some uppercase characters included in our passwords, which means we will also have these flags set to true. I do need to mention though that the program we created does not guarantee that our strings are going to contain upper or contain any symbols. We just said that the program should be able to include it in case we have these flags. So as a homework assignment, I want you to make sure that every string contains an uppercase and a symbol if these are set to true. Because let me show you right now, if we have a password of three characters or yeah, of three characters and we run the script, you'll see that some of them might not contain symbols and some of them might not contain uppercase characters because even if it's set to true, sometimes who knows what the odds are, it's not going to use those symbols because we're now grabbing punctuation from a combination string, which means it's completely random. So again, your homework problem is to make sure that there is a symbol and an uppercase character, no matter what the length of the string. Of course, if it's less than two characters, it's going to be hard to include both. But if it's more than three, you should be able to fit in an uppercase and a symbol such as nine minus X. That's perfect. But two curly bracket six does not fill the requirements that we inserted here. And with larger passwords, this becomes really rare because there's so much to choose from. But eventually you will run into cases, I'm sure that you will be missing either a special character or a symbol, even though it's highly unlikely. Powered by intellect, driven by values. That's what we chose to the satisfactions of our employees and to the satisfaction of our investors. It is very, very important for us to show growth because at the end of the day, if you don't make money hand over fist in anything that you do, it is not worth doing. That's been my philosophy right from when I founded Infosys along with my younger colleagues. And to do that, you need competence, you need intellect, you need good ideas, you need to learn very quickly from others who are better than you perhaps improve on those ideas and use them to become better and better. 
Let's build a QR code generator using Python. The result is going to look like this. Once we run the script, we're going to have this option to enter some text and whatever text you enter is going to be converted into a QR code, such as the one in the top right hand corner. So here you can add something such as a website. So www.website.com, for example, and it's going to generate that QR code for us. So now we have a QR code that has this website embedded inside it. And it's also going to give us the success message so that we know that the QR code was actually created. And you can also customize it with your own colors. If you wanted to have a black foreground, you can do that and you can say, this is a QR code and that's going to be inserted inside this QR code. So you can enter whatever kind of contents you want and then you can share this image with your friends or put it on a website or wherever you want because it's going to be rendered as a PNG. So let's get started immediately with creating this project. And the first thing we have to do is open up our terminal and we need to type in pip install QR code because we're going to be using the QR code package. Then we want to install the pillow library. And the pillow library is something you use with images and it helps you manipulate images. It helps you extract information from images. But in this case, we need the pillow library because we want to add callers to our QR code or we, or we want to be able to customize it. But as soon as you have both of those installed, you can type in import QR code and it's going to use pillow by default. We don't need to import it or anything. Now that we have it installed, it's going to be part of the project and Python's going to use it by default. Now for this example, we're going to create a class called myQR, which is going to simplify the QR code creation. And first we need an initializer and the initializer will take a size for the QR code. So I mean, how big you want it to be the dimensions and some padding, how much space you want around the QR code of type integer. Now we can type in self.qr is going to equal QR code dot QR code. And here we're going to provide a box size. So the box size is going to be the size and the border is going to be the padding. I selected padding as the argument because I think it makes more sense to me. Then we can create our first method. So here we'll type in def create QR and it's going to take a file name of type string, what you want the image to be called. And of course you can insert a path there if you want to insert it in a folder. And we also want to get the foreground caller that you want to use and the background caller that you want to use. And to get some text, we're going to type in user input of type string and that's going to equal input and we're just going to ask the user to enter some text. So enter text. Next, we're going to surround everything by a try and accept block. And I'll explain why in just a moment. But here we need to call self.qr and we want to add data to that QR code. And what we want to add is the user input. Then we can type in QR image. It's going to equal self.qr.make image. And here we will provide a fill caller. So fill underscore caller. And that's going to equal the foreground caller. And the background caller, which is called back caller, is going to equal the background caller. Then we will call this QR image and we will say save. And we need to save it to the file name. Then we can print that it was successfully created. So success fully created. And we will insert the file name inside here. So file name. So we know which file we created. And in case there is some sort of error, we'll accept exception as E and we will print error E. So the reason I have this accept block is because there is a limit for QR codes. And I think that was more than 7,000 characters. So in some random scenario that the users inserting the story of their life inside the QR code, we're just going to tell them, hey, don't do that. I mean, you can handle that differently, but to keep it simple, we're just going to say, okay, there's an error. And actually that's all we need to write for our class. Now we can create a main function to keep things clean. And we're going to insert all the code we need to create the QR code inside here. 
So my QR is going to equal my QR code. And we will insert a size of 30 with a padding of two. So it's a small padding. Then we will call this object. So my QR, if I can get to that. So my QR, create QR code. And we're going to call this sample.png. Then we're going to give it a foreground caller. And here you can decide to insert either the RGB values, or you can also decide to insert a hex value, or you can try to just insert the color itself, such as black. So for the first example, we will use black, and for the background, we will say white. Then all that's left to do is to say def, or not def, but uh, if name is equal to main, and insert our main function. Now we can run this, and we can say, okay, website.com, and it will say that we successfully created the PNG. But you might be wondering, where is it? Well, it's in our folder. If you just open your folder, you'll see that you'll now have a new QR code. So how did I see that in the sidebar? Well, if you right click on this and you say split right, you'll see you'll have two windows now. And something nice to do when you are experimenting with the QR code is to have this split view so that you can work on the code and edit it while seeing the changes being reflected in the right side. So for example, if we want to put green here instead for the foreground caller, we can do that and we can rerun the script and say, hello world. And if we tap on enter, it's going to update the changes in this window over here without us having to actually leave our script, which I think is really cool because it's nice to see those changes affected immediately. And you can also change it to blue with a background of red. And I warn you, this is going to burn your eyes because these two colors are just not compatible most of the time. So here we can say uh, www, I regret my life .com, And you'll get this ugly QR code. As you can see, I, I warned you, this is not a good color combination. So let's quickly get rid of that by saying white and black. So we have a inverted QR code. We're going to rerun this and we're going to say few. And then we're going to have this QR code here, which is much better than what we were dealing with earlier. And one last thing I really recommend instead of taking user input each time when you're playing around with it, that you duplicate this, comment this out, and add some dummy text that you want to test for, such as www.website.com. It just makes refreshing this so much easier. So you don't have to do it over and over and over. You can just do that. And you can also play around with these parameters. So you can say black, white, you can say the size will be 50 and the padding will be 10. And if you run that again, and you open this, you'll see you'll get this new QR code. And up here, you can actually see the dimensions of your QR code, how many pixels, the colors, this is five kilobytes. And if we change this down to 10, you'll see it'll be much smaller and that the dimensions will also be smaller. Whether you are dark or whether you are fair or whether you're round or square or tall or short shouldn't really be the, uh, the criteria of being beautiful. At the end of the day, you've got to feel confident. And for me, that is what is beautiful. If you're confident, if you can carry that confidence, if you can go out in the world and make a name for yourself, irrespective, I think for me, that is, that is something that you could really talk about more than anything. For this project, we're going to be creating a website checker. So it's going to take a list of websites and it's going to check what their current status is. So maybe it's offline, maybe it's online, maybe there's something wrong with the website, but we're going to be able to use a CSV file to loop through a lot of websites and check what they are up to. So for example, if we run this script, if we tap on play, you'll see that it's slowly going to give us back information based on the website, and it's going to tell us whether it's actually up and running. And we're also going to handle some situations such as dealing with websites that don't exist. So here it's going to say, could not get information for this website because it actually just doesn't exist. And then we also have websites that also don't exist or URLs that don't exist. So we'll get a 404 error that says not found, nothing matches the given URI or we might also get a forbidden error. So we're getting a lot of information back based on which websites we are looping through. 200 okay means the website is up and running and that we got a successful request. 
So as you can see, these are just 10 websites we put through, but you're going to be able to insert hundreds if you want. Right now, this is a simple CSV file with 10 different websites. And I'm not going to write this websites.csv file out by hand for this lesson, but it will be available in the source code section or in the resource section of this Udemy course. Go to the project that is titled Website Checker and you can copy it from there. And in PyCharm, if you want to create a CSV file, just hold Command or Control plus N to create a new file. Tap on that, type in websites.csv, or actually this will just be called test, and you'll be able to insert your CSV values. So we're not going to need that one because we already have one that's called websites. And again, this is available on my GitHub repository. So just tap on the resource section and go to the source code if you want to just copy and paste this one. Otherwise, we can go to main.py and get started with writing our script. So first of all, we need to import CSV to work with CSV functionality. Then we need to import requests, which for me is already installed, but for you, you're going to have to open up the terminal and type in pip install requests, and then you'll be able to import requests. Then there's another package you need to import, and this one's called fake underscore user agent. And once you have that installed, you can close the terminal because we don't need that anymore. And we can import from fake user agent, import user agent. And I'll explain that in just a moment, but let's continue with the imports. And finally, from HTTP, we're going to import HTTP status. So we can get some statuses back. Now, the first thing we want to do is get the websites from the CSV file. So here we'll type in def get websites and we need a CSV path of type string and that will return to us a list of strings that we can work with. And of course, that list of string is going to contain the websites. So the websites of type list of string is going to equal an empty list so that we can populate it with websites. Then below that, we can type in with open because we need to open this CSV file in read mode so we can grab values from it as file. And to use this CSV, we need to create a reader object. So the reader is going to equal csv.reader from this file. Then we can say for row in reader. And with that, we can finally loop through that reader and get the values back. But first we need to check if HTTPS colon double slash is not in the row at the index of one, then we're going to append that. So website dot append f HTTPS colon double slash, and we need to add the row at the index of one. The row at the index of one is going to be this row over here. So Apple is at the index of one, Facebook's at the index of one, and one, two, three, four, five, and the indexing is at the index of zero. So that would be row at the index of zero. This is row at the index of one. So we need to do that, of course, for each row in the reader. And we actually need the HTTPS to make the request. And as you can see, none of my websites actually have that. So we are checking whether it does have that because if you download the websites from some sort of list on the internet, some might have HTTPS, some might not. And whatever it is, we want to make sure that we can append this. Else, we're going to just append the websites as they are. Because if the website already has HTTPS, we do not want to append this to it. So here you can just append row at the index of one. Now you might be thinking, okay, what if the website has HTTP? And you got me there. We're not handling that in this tutorial, but it would be a good idea as well to handle websites that have only HTTP. For example, we can check if HTTPS is not in row one or HTTP in row one, then we'll do the following. So this is much more safe because of course, if a website has HTTP, we do not want to add HTTPS in front of HTTP because this would look absolutely ridiculous. So that's a much better check than what I showed you earlier. So maybe you want to do that, but we'll just keep it simple for now and leave it at that. At the end of this, we're going to return the websites. 
So that's our first function that just takes the websites from the CSV. And it's a good idea to test it. So we're going to print get websites from the CSV file path, which is just going to be websites.csv. And if we run this, we should get our websites back as a list with HTTPS in front of each one of them. And we can also test what happens if we actually have HTTPS here. So we do that. If that already exists, it should not append it one more time to that website. So if we scroll to SoundCloud, it should look exactly the same as from earlier. But next we need to get a user agent. So def get user agent. And that's going to return to us a string. Now for user agent, we need to create a user agent object. So that's going to be UA is equal to user agent. And what we want to return is the user agent. And here you get the option to choose between Chrome, Firefox, Internet Explorer, Edge, and so on. So what a user agent does is tell the browser essentially, or tells the website that we're visiting what browser we are on. So to demonstrate that, I'm just going to print the user agent now. So get user agent, if I can get to that, so get user agent. And if I print that, you'll see that the user agent for Firefox is going to be Mozilla 5.0, and it's going to have all of this information that the browser can read. So we're simulating essentially that we're on Firefox for the browser. And this can sometimes help you get around the restrictions of websites because a lot of websites have these safety mechanisms put into place to stop crawlers or scripts from getting free information from them. So sometimes you're going to have to use a user agent to get around that. We might change this to Chrome if we want, and we'll leave it at that. Next, we want to get the status description. So def get status description. And that's going to take a status code of type integer, and it's going to return to us a string, which is going to be the description. So for value in HTTPS status, if the value is equal to the status code, we're going to create a description from it. So here we can type in description of type string is equal to this formatted description, parentheses, value, and the value name. So value dot name, and outside of the parentheses, value dot description. And I'll show you exactly what all of this is in just a moment, but then we want to return that description. And if none of this works, we're going to add another return, which is going to simulate the else block. So return parentheses, question mark three times, and unknown status code. So here we're checking for the values in HTTP status, which I did not show you earlier, but this is an enum. So when you type in HTTP status, you're going to get forbidden, not extended, or bad request, you're going to get all of these HTTP statuses. So if you type in bad request, you're also going to get the option to get the value and the name. And I can actually just print this so you have a better idea. We'll just print bad request, name, and I'll duplicate that and say value. So if we print these two values, you'll see bad request and 400. So what we're doing here is inserting the status code we'll get from the website. And for each value in the HTTP status, we're checking that our status code is equal to one of them inside the HTTP status, because this gives us a lot of free information that we can use instead of writing this out by hand. Next, let's check the website. So check website. And it's going to be a website of type string, and it's going to take a user agent. So user agent. And here, we are at the easy part, we just need to try to get that code. So the code of type integer is going to equal requests dot get. And here we need to insert the website. And the headers are going to be the user agent with a user agent. And finally, we want to get the status code. So dot status code. So that's the code we're going to get. Then we want to print the website followed by the get status description for that code. Otherwise, we need to accept this exception that we might have a website that's not compatible or that we can't reach. And here we'll just type in print could 
not get information for website. And we'll insert the website so the user knows what they are dealing with. So those are the four functions we need for this script. Now we can create a main function just to keep things nice and clean. And here we'll type in sites of type list of string is going to equal get websites from the website CSV. The user agent is going to equal or it's of type string first and it's going to equal get user agent. And now we just need to loop through those websites. So for sites in sites, and this actually should be sites up here. So for sites in sites, we're going to check that website. So check the website with the site and the user agent. Now, all we need to do is check if name is equal to main and run main. And if everything went smoothly, we should have this website checker. So request okay, okay, okay. Everything seems okay besides whatsapp.com hello because that was not found. And Udemy is not letting us access it because it has a safety mechanism put into place. But sometimes that can be fixed by changing the user agent. So we can add something such as Internet Explorer instead. And this time we're going to go through everything once again, but it's still forbidden. So that didn't work either. We can try with Firefox. It's still forbidden. So none of those helped for Udemy and LinkedIn had one that said too many requests. So better that we stick to Chrome. But still for a majority of websites, we're able to check whether they are up and running or what their current status is. And you can modify this, of course, to be anything you want. You can also say, uh, let's say abc.com or foxnews.com. And this can also be youtube.com. And I'm just going to remove the rest from the CSV file. And we will go back to main and tap on the green arrow. Now it's checking all four of them and they are all online. And as you can see, it tells us 200, okay, request fulfilled, document follows. So we get a lot of good information for each website. If a website goes down, we're going to get a different message. If a website has a page that doesn't exist, we're going to get not found. So we'll get a lot of information back for each website. I probably enjoyed playing Mr. Bean the most because he's a character who's furthest away from my own character. As a person, I don't like him at all. I think he's very odd and pretty weird and not very nice. What's fun about it is it, 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 it's, it's an escape. You know, when you play the character, you don't care what you do. It's a weird kind of release. First time we did the character, I'm fairly certain, was 1979 on stage. And that was when we had developed, I think, two sketches. One was the beach sketch in which he's trying to change into a swimming trunks on the beach. And then there's the one in the church in which he's sitting in the church and he misbehaves while someone's spouting a sermon. For this project, we're going to be creating a script that brute forces a word, a password, or any sort of text in Python. So for example, pretend we are searching for the password lol1. If we run this script, it's going to go through every single combination until it finds that and it's going to crack it. So I mean, theoretically, of course, if you were looking for something random, you wouldn't know what it is. But just like with a bike and a combination lock, you would flip through every single number until you find one that actually works. So that's exactly what we're doing here. And we also have a mechanism that goes through common words so that if we want to make this faster, we will try to go through the common words first and we might be able to guess it instantly. So this is one of the more cool projects you can create in Python. Although I highly advise you don't use this anywhere on the internet because one, it's very simple and a lot of websites have very strong safety mechanisms against this. And two, it's highly illegal to try to crack any passwords that don't belong to you. So this is for educational purposes only. But to get started, create a new empty project in PyCharm and I'm going to increase the font size just a bit. And the first thing we will do is create a text file. And we're just going to call this file words.text. And inside here, insert some words that are commonly guessed. If you make a quick search on Google and you say the top 10,000 most common words, there will be a result on GitHub. I recommend you copy that. 
Otherwise, in my GitHub repository, what you can find in the resource section of this course will contain 10 words for you to play around with, or actually nine words. So if we copy and paste that inside, each one should be on a new line because we're going to loop through all of these common words before doing the brute force. But once you have a text file with words, and I mean, at this point, you can even type these out, there's only nine of them. But as soon as you have these words or other words in your words.txt file, make your way over to main because then we will start coding. So the first thing we need to do is import iter tools. Then we also want to import string and import time. And iter tools is an inbuilt module that helps us with iterables and looping through them and performing very efficient operations with them. But the first function we want to create is the common guess function because we want to check our file for common words before brute forcing. So he will type in word of type string and that's the word we are looking for. And it's going to return to us either string or none because there might be no results. So with open, and here we need to insert our text file. So words.txt in read mode as words, we're going to do the following. So word underscore list of type list of string is going to equal words dot read. And we want to call split lines because it's going to read every line and it's going to split them into a list. But as soon as we have that word list, we can check for I match in enumerate the word list, and we're going to set the start of enumerate to one. Then we can check if match is equal to word, we can return f common match, and we will insert our match. And we will also tell the user which number it was. So here we can type in i, and it will tell us which position the word we just guessed was located in our text file. So of course, the next logical step is to actually test it. So here we can type in common guess. And if we type in carrot, because we're searching for a carrot, for example, and we run this script, nothing's going to happen because we should print this, of course. So if we print that, it should say common match is going to be carrot, and that's number nine in our list. So that's working perfectly. And if we have something that's not there, such as ABC, it's going to return none because we had no matches. So the first functionality from our program is done. Now we can move on to the brute force. So here we'll type in brute force and it's going to take a word of type string, a length of type integer, whether it contains digits is going to be of type Boolean and that's going to be set initially to false and whether it contains symbols, which should also be of type Boolean which will be set to false initially. And that's going to return to us either a string or none. Now, first we need to decide on which characters we want to use for our brute force. So here we're going to use characters of type string and we're going to call string dot ashi lowercase. So we're going to use lowercase characters in our guessing. And if the user wants digits, we're going to of course append to the characters plus equal string dot digits and if the and if the user wants to guess a password with symbols as well we need to add that flag so if symbols characters plus equals string dot punctuation so that's going to increase the complexity and the reason we don't use all of this immediately is because the more characters we have the slower our program's going to be since it has to loop through all of these characters when it's trying to check so if you have only lowercase characters, it's not going to take much time because there's going to be around 26 characters or letters in the alphabet, which means we only have to loop through 25 letters in theory. But if we add digits, that's another 10 characters. And if we add punctuation, another who knows how many characters. And this is not even including uppercase characters. So you need to use these wisely, depending on which word you're trying to guess. And that's why a lot of websites recommend you use an uppercase character digits and punctuation because it just makes the password nearly impossible to guess. But right below that, we're going to type in attempts of type integer and that's equal to zero. Now for guess in itertools.product, we're going to insert the characters and then we need to specify a repeat length. So repeat is going to be set to length. Then we can type in attempts plus equals one. 
so we can keep track of how many attempts we actually went through. And the guess is going to be the string of empty space dot join the list of guess. So what it's a tools product does is, for example, if you have ABC as the characters you are guessing from, it's going to make every single combination imaginable with those characters. So it's going to try AAA and then AAB and then AAC and so on. It's going to make all of these combinations all the way to CCC. So we're going to go through every single combination using the product. And the reason we need to use dot join is because what ITA tools returns to us is actually a list of combinations. So we're not going to get ABC written as ABC. We're going to get this written as a list of A, B, and C, all separated. But we don't want that. We want the combinations together. So that's why we are joining it. Anyways, if the guess is equal to the word that we are looking for, we're going to return quotation marks word was cracked in and we're going to place the attempts followed by a formatting trick, which is a colon and a comma. So that's going to add some separators to big numbers to make it easier to read in the console. And we're going to say guesses at the end. And for debugging, you might want to print the guess and the attempts because it looks really cool and people think you're kind of hacking or something. But the reason you shouldn't use print when you're actually performing this is because this actually takes a lot of resources, which means if you print once, of course it takes 0.001 seconds, for example. But if you have to print a billion times, 0.001 seconds becomes quite a massive number. So once you're done testing, just comment that out because it takes too many resources. We'll leave it in there for now and I'll show you later how much time we save when we remove that. But now let's actually create our main function. So def main and inside here we can say print searching and we're going to pretend that the word we're searching for is equal to abc1. So a simple password just to get started. And we want to measure how long it takes. So we're going to get the start time of type float, which is going to equal time dot performance counter. And that will give us the current time. And we will compare this to another time later to get the difference. Now it's time we actually perform the operation of searching. So we're going to use some funky syntax. We're going to check if the common match and we're going to use a walrus operator. And I'll show you what that does in just a moment. But with that, we can also assign common guess to it. So common guess of the password. If we do that, we're going to print common match. So the first thing that's going to happen is that this is going to run and it's going to return something. And right now we know that it returns either a string or none. But regardless of what it returns, it's going to assign it to common match before we run the if statement, which means if this is none, this will not execute. But if this has some value, it's going to execute. So that's just a neat trick you can use in Python with the walrus operator. Else, if cracked, walrus operator again is equal to brute force. And here we need to insert the word we're searching for and the length of the word. So the length of the word in this case will be four characters. We're going to set digits to true because there is a digit in there and symbols are going to be set to true. So if we find something in there, it's going to return to us the password, of course. And that means that we can print the result. Else, we're going to print that there was no match, ellipses. But below that, just like with the start time, we need to get the end time. So we will just copy and paste that below and change this to end time. Then we can print the result. We can print the rounded result of end time minus start time. And we're going to round that to two decimals and say seconds at the end. So this will tell us how much time it took. Then if all goes well, we can do our if name is equal to main check and run main. And for this very easy example, we're just looking for a password named ABC one. So if we tap on run, we have a syntax error because I forgot to add a colon at the end of this expression. So once we add that there, we can run this again and it's going to guess ABC one in less than 5,000 guesses. And that was pretty easy because it was short and it was at the beginning of the brute force. 
But the second you change this to a letter such as X, it's going to take a bit longer because it's more towards the end. And right now, for some reason, we decided to do it with symbols and that should be set to false because there are no symbols. So if we do it without symbols, it's going to try it all again. And eventually, after a million guesses, it was able to brute force into XBC1. But as you notice there, as soon as we included symbols, it took significantly longer because it has to loop through all the opportunities or all the possibilities with symbols included. And that's why if we set digits to false and we look for a password that does not contain digits, it's going to be significantly faster. It just has to make less computations, which results in less resources being used. But if we have something such as Apple, it's not going to take any time because that's part of our common words. So it's probably worth it to populate this with 10,000 of the most common words you know, because this should be the first priority before moving on to brute forcing. Also, another thing is that we have a fixed length here. And if we have, let's say, some sort of text that says AAA, we're not going to be able to find that text because we told the program to only look for four in length. So we're going to have to manually change that to five if we want to find a word with five characters in length. So if we run that now, it was cracked in one guess. I guess that was the first guess, but it was able to find it. So something you would want to do to fix this would be to add another for loop. So for example, for I in range, let's say four or actually three to six. So we're going to look for passwords that range from three characters in length to five characters in length. And with that, we can insert this in the for loop. And instead of checking for the length of four, we can check for the length of I. So we're going to do this many times. So we don't have to always know the length of the password. And I'm going to change that to BBBB just to show you what's going to happen. So if we run this now, it's going to go through four characters, then it's going to go through five characters. So that gave us a bit more leeway, but the more characters you loop through, the harder or the more resources it's going to take. So after seven or eight, you're going to need a really intense computer to do this fast enough. But otherwise, if you remove the print statement, for example, you'll see that instead of 2.48 seconds, we will get something almost immediately. And there was no match for the three letter combinations, the four letter combinations, but for the five letter combinations, it was immediate. And as you could see, there was a small bug there with this range. And that is because it continued searching for the password because we did not break here. So that's something you can work on in your own time. I'm going to remove the for loop and the break because this is supposed to be simple. So specify your length, which is five. And we're just going to loop through that. The source code for this entire project can be found in the resource section. So you can play around with what I have there. But that was the main concept behind using brute force in Python. When I was uh, just starting to do stand up, there was a lot of guys who had full time jobs and they got degrees and, you know, they would work their full time job and then they would just do stand up like a couple nights a week. They never made it. Yeah. It was the obsessed guys and women the people that were just like i this is my fucking life this is what i do i'm gonna do this yeah those are the ones that do it the no safety net people are the ones that made it and keep improving and keep learning and learn from your mistakes and learn from your setbacks and yeah. and keep trying to push and get better and improve if you do all those things as as hopeless and helpless as it seems if you continue to improve you've got to get to a better place you got to yeah. get better and one day you'll be undeniable for this project, we're going to be creating an image downloader. And if we run this script, it's going to allow us to enter a URL. So this URL should contain an image and I'm just going to paste this in. And this is just something from Google. I wanted to search for an apple. And as you can see around here, there's a red apple.jpg. So we're all set to go with that. And then we just need to give it a name. So I'll call this apple. Uh, image and tap on enter. Then it's going to download it and it's going to tell us whether it was downloaded successfully. So with that being done, we can open our folder and inside images, we'll see this Apple image that I searched for on Google. And it's actually quite a cool project because it's going to take some elements from the URL. For example, there's the JPEG part, which it appended to our image over here. So as you can see, downloaded images slash apple image dot jpeg 
So we actually were able to infer that just by entering a URL. But to get started, we're going to create a new empty project. And in here, we need to open up the terminal and type in pip install requests. So we can make that request and actually get the data back from the website. Now inside our folder, we're going to create a directory called images. So we don't convolute our folder with a lot of random images. We just want them to be in one place for this example. So we have this image folder, but I'm going to close that since we won't use it for quite a bit. And next we're going to import OS and import requests. Now the first function we're going to create is called get extension because when we enter a URL inside the URL, there should be a section that holds either .png, .jpg, .gif, .svg. It should have some sort of extension and we want to extract that from the image URL. So image URL of type string, which will return to us a string or none, depending on whether it has an extension that we can grab or not. Then we have to create a variable called extensions of type list of string. And this will equal a list of all the extensions that we want to recognize. For example, .png, .jpg, and of course there's the other version, .jpg, and we have dot gif or gif and finally dot svg and if you want to include more extensions just add them inside here so it can recognize more but i'm going to only cover the basic five and the rest is quite easy so for extension in extensions we're going to check if the extension is in image url and if it is we're just going to return the extension so we'll know exactly which extension it contains so we can actually download the image in the correct format. And that's all we have to do here. I mean, if it doesn't find anything here, functions by default are going to return none. So we don't have to do anything. If this doesn't return anything, we will get none back. Under that, we need to download the image. So def download image. And here we're going to take a image URL of type string a name that we're going to name it of type string and the folder that we want to place it inside, which will be of type string and set to none initially in case we don't really care about placing it in a folder. So that's optional, of course, for the user. I think it's a better experience. But with that, we can check if the extension and we're going to use the walrus operator again. So if the extension is going to get an extension, we're going to use it. And before we use it, we need to check if there is a folder to put it in. But as soon as we have the check, we can say, okay, if there's a folder, we're going to create an image name of type string. And we're going to format this by placing in the folder slash the name and the extension. So we're appending the extension if there is an extension to the end of the name that we gave this file and placing it in a folder. Else, we're going to create the same image name of type string and we're going to say okay this is just going to contain the name and the extension and it's not going to be placed inside a folder but what happens if all of this goes wrong well then we're going to just raise an exception because we shouldn't be able to move on if we cannot find the correct extension so here we'll type in image extension could not be located so that means you're going to have to add some more extensions here or you're going to have to change something. Below this, we can check if OS path is file. So this just checks whether this image name file path actually exists or whether there is a file that exists under this image name. And if that does happen, we don't want to overwrite it. We just want to raise an exception that the name we gave it already exists. So we should not overwrite it. So exception file name already exists because in the current state, if we give it the same name as another image, it's just going to overwrite that and you will never know why the previous image disappeared. Or I mean, you will know, but it's going to be hard for users to know. So here we can add a comment, check if name already exists. And sometimes I just like to add comments to split functionality up. Usually a function should not contain too much functionality, but in the worst case scenarios, I do like having comments because it shows that, okay, this is one block of functionality. Now we have another block of functionality. 
it just makes it easier. Finally, we're going to download the image. So we'll type in download image so that we can try the following. And inside here, we're going to grab some image content, which is going to be of type bytes this time. And that's going to equal requests.get image URL dot content. And that's going to return to us the bytes of the image. Now with open image name in write bytes mode as handler, because we need to create a handler for this, we're going to call that handler and type in write and image content. We want to write that image content and we are writing that image content to this file path. Then we can print a friendly message if it goes well that the user downloaded the following file. So quotation marks and image name followed by successfully. So everybody's happy. And of course we need to finish with an accept block which accepts exception as E because we don't really know what's going to happen. And we're going to print error with the error. So we can fix that in case anything pops up, but at least we have a safety mechanism. And that's actually all we need to get this script up and running. So now we can type in if name is equal to main and all that's left to do is to get the input URL, which is going to be of type string. And that's going to take the input from the user that says enter a URL. And I'm going to duplicate this to save some time, I hope. We're going to get an input name that says, what would you like to name it? So the user can name the file. Then we will print downloading to show that the program's actually processing something. And finally, we will call download image with the input URL. And we need to give the name an input name and the folder is going to be the one we created, images. So it should be exactly the same name as this one over here, or else it's going to throw an error that there is no folder named whatever you named it. So it has to match a certain folder. But I'm going to copy a link or a URL from my other project, and I'm going to run this script. So first we will enter this URL, which is going to give us an SVG of Python, theoretically, and we'll just name it Python potato. And when we tap on enter, it should save it to our image folder. So if we tap on this, we now have the SVG of the Python logo. But let's go back to main. And this time, I'm going to just get rid of the folder to show you what happens. So if we rerun this and add the Python logo, we say Python logo, and tap on download, it's still going to download it, but it's now going to store it in the main folder. So that can get quite messy and I much prefer to have it inside a folder. So let's change it back one more time and let's try one more. Let's enter this other URL that I have. And this is going to be from Wallhaven. They have a lot of cool HD wallpapers. Definitely recommend it if you're looking for a cool wallpaper and we'll tap on enter and we'll name it uh, something. And it's going to download it. It took a bit longer, but it got it. And now we have something.jpg. And if we open our image folder again, we should have a cool image of this astronaut who's just taking a nap. But that was the entire project. And something really cool about this function is that if you have an API or a list of URLs that you want to download images from, you can easily do it just using this function over and over. Of course, you might have to get more creative with how you're going to name the files especially if you're doing it automatically, but I'm going to leave that as a homework problem for yourself. Just create a list of image URLs, loop through them and try to give them names automatically. If you punish people too much for failure, then they will respond accordingly and the innovation you will get will be very incrementalist. Nobody's going to try anything bold for fear of getting fired or being, you know, uh, punished in some way. So there, there must be a re um, the, the, the risk reward must be balanced um, and, and, and favor taking uh, bold moves. Uh, otherwise, uh, it will not happen. For this project, we're going to be creating a video to MP3 converter. And we're going to be doing this through YouTube. So the user is going to enter a custom YouTube link and that's going to be converted to MP3. So to get started, the first thing we need to do is import 
or not import, but pip install PyTube, which is a package that helps us download YouTube videos easily. And once we have that put into place, we can import OS and import Shuttle. And finally, we need to import from PyTube YouTube. And there's actually one more thing I want to specify before we continue. And that is that I have a folder called audio in my project. So create that before moving on with the project because we're going to be storing all of our audio tracks in that folder. So here we're going to type in URL to MP3. And here we need to enter a video URL of type string. And this function is going to actually do everything. It's quite a short script. So the first thing we need to do is create a video file, which is going to take YouTube with the video URL. And we need to call dot streams dot filter. And we just want to get the audio. So get audio only. And this is going to return to us the highest quality audio or the highest bitrate audio stream for the given video format. Then we can type in video file dot download so we can actually download it. Now it's going to give us back only the audio, but it's going to be in the MP4 format and we want it to be MP3. So the MP4 name is going to equal string or it's going to be of type string and that will be the video file dot default file name. And the MP3 name, the one we actually want is going to be mp4 name dot replace and we want to replace the dot mp4 with the dot mp3 then we will call our operating system and rename the file so we're going to rename the file of mp4 name with mp3 name and there's actually two things i need to specify the first thing is that this should be rename and not remove and the second thing is it doesn't just rename it, it actually renames the file. So once it finds this file of MP4, it's going to replace it with this name over here. So it's not just the same thing as replace, it actually renames the file path. And finally, we need to use Shuttle to move the file to the folder. So move, and we want to move the MP3 name to the audio folder. And next we can create our main function. And the main function is going to try to get an input URL from the user. So input URL of type string, which will equal input of please enter a URL. Then we will call URL to MP3. The video URL will be the input URL and we will print finished downloading. And we will accept the exception as E to keep things simple, we're just going to say something went wrong and we will insert that error. Now, all that's left to do is to call if name is equal to main and run this. So if we run this, it's going to ask us to enter a URL and coincidentally, I have this Skrillex URL, so I'm going to enter that. And as soon as you enter that, it should download it. And if everything went well, it should be in our audio folder. Now in PyCharm, you can't really preview that or anything, but if you actually drag this from PyCharm to your desktop, you'll see that it's going to be a working MP3 file. So just like that, we created a project that allows us to download MP3 from any video URL. Or actually there's one thing that I forgot to mention, and that is that if you're running this on Mac, there's a chance you're going to get a certificate error when you try to run this. And there is a solution to that, and that is using this command in the terminal. So open up your terminal, copy and paste this command and tap on enter. And it's going to upgrade your permissions so that you can actually run the script. Also, it's important to note that it depends on which Python version you are using. So if you're using Python 3.12, just change it here. It has to be the correct version for this to work, of course. We don't really know much about you. No, like, what are your hobbies and likes? And... Uh, yeah, I tend to keep myself to myself a lot. I tend, I'm not on social media in any shape or form. I yeah. prefer to keep all my activities of a personal level, personal, personal and <laughs> private, um, just because I find it much more relaxing. I find the whole concept of social media just not Keeping up with sort it, of right? unrelaxing. Yeah. It feels like an unrelaxing thing, so I don't do it. We're going to be creating one of my favorite projects in Python and that is the chatbot. But this is a bit more complex than a regular if else check 
because it's going to be able to recognize some words, even if they are spelled incorrectly, it will still be able to recognize them and give you an appropriate response. But uh, let me demonstrate that by displaying the program or running the program. And here it will say you, and you can enter whatever text you want. You can say hello, and it will say hey there. You can also say hello with an O detached, and it will still be able to understand that. Otherwise, you can ask something such as how are you? And it will understand as well. It will respond, I'm doing good, thanks. And we can ask it, what can you do? And it's a bot that can answer questions. Okay, great. Finally, we can ask maybe what time is it? And the bot doesn't know because we did not include that functionality. Otherwise, if we type in something completely random, we also have a check for that. That's going to make the bot respond something basic, such as, could you please repeat that? So it's a really cool project and we should get started immediately by creating a new empty project. And the first thing we have to do inside here is import from diffLib the get close matches function. And that's going to be used to compare a list and a string, and it's going to find the best match in that list so we can get an appropriate response. But the first function is going to do just that. So get best match, and it's going to take a user question of type string, and it's going to take some questions of type dictionary. And that's going to return to us a string or none, because there's a chance there will be no answer that matches what we are looking for. So we want to return none in that case then the questions are going to be of type list of string. And that's going to equal a list comprehension because we want to take the questions out of the dictionary. So it's going to be Q for Q in questions, then we can provide or create a variable called matches of type list, which is going to equal get close matches. And we need to provide a word or a string, which is going to be our question. And we want to compare that to the list of questions to find which question we actually entered. And we're going to specify that we only want to return the first best one because it can return multiple, but we just care about getting the first one. And there's also a cutoff parameter that we need to include. And I'm going to set this to 60% or 0 0.6, which means it should be at least 60% of a match to the user question to be a valid response. And you can put this higher or lower, but the thing is the higher the cutoff, the harder it is going to be to recognize certain words, because right now if you type in hello and the user types in hell, this is only an 80% match, which is very acceptable of course, and it will still recognize that as hello. So play around with that if you want your bot to be more strict on what the user types. Otherwise, if there is a match, because again, there might be no matches, we're just going to return the match or the first match, the match at the index of zero. Otherwise, it's going to return none. Then we can define our chatbot. And the only thing our chatbot needs is some knowledge of type dictionary. Then we want to get some user input of type string, which will equal the input of you. So that's the prompt we will have to simulate a chat. And we want to get the best match of type string or none. So it's an optional and that will equal get best match for the user input. And that's going to search inside the knowledge base. Now, if there is an answer, and I say if because we're using the walrus operator to call knowledge.get and we want to get the best match because this is going to return to us a question formatted correctly so that we can use it as a key for knowledge.get in that dictionary. But if there is an answer, we can print that the bot uses that answer. So bot answer. Else, if there is no answer, that means that the bot has no idea what we are talking about. So we'll say, bot, I do not understand. So that's all the functionality we need to create this bot. Now we just need to create some dummy data so that the chatbot actually has a brain and then we can use it. So as always, we'll type in if name is equal to main and we will create a brain of type dictionary for our bot. And this is actually the knowledge base. So you can call it knowledge base if you want. I thought brain was just a fun word for this project. But the first question we're going to create is hello. And it's not really a question, but 
It's what we want the user to type in to prompt this response. So hey there is what the bot will respond. And we can also type in how are you? And the bot should respond, I am good, thanks. And I'll put those in quotation marks. And this is exactly how you can create questions and answers for your bot. And whatever we type in has to be at least 60% similar to this phrase to trigger I am good, thanks. Now we can say, uh, what time is it? And the bot will say, don't know, don't care. Because this bot has quite an attitude. And then we can also say something such as bye, and the bot will say, see you. So those are the questions we will use. Of course, you can add as many as you want and you can get really creative with this. You can even add some functions here that can trigger certain functionality. So there's a lot you can do here, but this is just the basis. Then below that, all we need to do is call our chatbot and insert a brain for the knowledge argument. And with that being done, we can run this bot and I'm just going to scroll down here so I can remember what I programmed it to respond to. So here we can say hello with an exclamation mark and it responded and the process finished. So there is one thing I forgot and that is to put all of this in a while true loop to simulate an ongoing conversation. So let's try that again. Now we have hello exclamation mark. I'll say hey there. We can say how are you with a question mark. We can also say, how are you? And it will still be able to respond to that. And that's the best part about this chatbot. It can easily recognize phrases even if they are spelled incorrectly. Then we can say, what time is it? The bot doesn't know, doesn't care, neither do I. And we will just say goodbye to finish this project. And the bot will say, see you. So for homework, I definitely recommend you start playing around with this even swapping this with a JSON file to keep this much more clean because having too much data in your script can get quite messy. So if you could load a JSON file instead of just directly building it here, I think that would be much cleaner. And also adding some sort of function here that says maybe if you ask what time it is, it might be able to give you the correct time. Now is the time to take risk. You don't have kids. As you get older, your obligations increase. So you the and once you have a family, you start taking risk, not just for yourself, but for your family as well. It gets much harder to uh, do things that might not work out. Um, so now is the time to do that uh, before, you, before you have those obligations. So I would, I would encourage you to take risks now, do something bold. Um, you won't regret it. For this project, we're going to be creating a URL shortener. So as soon as we run this script, we're going to have the option to enter a URL. And in this case, I'm going to enter this large URL, which I took from Google. It's just a Google search, but as soon as we tap on enter, it's going to spit out a shortened link. And if we tap on this shortened link, it will take us exactly to the page which I had originally copied the URL from. So it's a simple project, but it's quite effective. And we are going to do this in Python, but let's delete everything as always. So we can start from scratch. Now, the very first thing we have to do is go to this URL because we're going to be using an API that does the shortening for us. And I'm going to be leaving this link in the resource section of this course. So you can just tap on that. And then you're going to have to sign up for an account. It's free to sign up, so you can just do that. And once you get to this page here, which is the first page you should see when you log in, you're going to want to go to the API section down here because inside here, they're going to have a section called API key. And we need this API key to actually make some requests. And originally, you're not going to have any API key here. So you're going to have to tap on manage API key and generate slash change the API key and tap on OK. Then it's going to load and create a new API key for you so that you can insert it in your project. Then just copy that API key and go back to the project because we're going to be using it later. But first of all, we need to import from typing the final type and I'm going to use that to define constants. Then you're going to want to import requests. And as always, if you don't have this installed, just go to the terminal and type in pip install requests so that you can add it to your project and so that you can use it. 
But first of all, we're going to type an API key of type final, which will be of type string is going to equal our API key. So this is the API key we'll be using to make requests. Next, we're going to have a base URL, and that's going to equal final of type string as well. And we just need to paste in the URL that is used to make the API request. In this case, it's HTTPS colon double slash cut dot Lee slash API slash API dot PHP. And you can find that under the API documentation. So if we actually go back to API, tap on API documentation, click on the regular API, you should see that we have this link over here, which we will be using to make the request. But let's create a function called shorten link. And here we're going to place in a full link of type string. And the first thing we need to create is a payload. And the payload is essentially the settings we use when we make a request. So for example, we want to add the parameters of key, which is the API key and of the short, which is the full link. So short is the link we want to shorten. And that's all information you'd find on the API documentation. I'm not making it up. It's something that they actually have. And you can see it immediately in the API documentation that we have the key here and the short. And there are some other parameters that we can use, but we're not going to be using those for this project. But with that, we can add a request, which will equal requests.get, and we will use the base URL with the parameters, which is the payload. Then we're going to get some data back of type dictionary, which will equal request.json. Now, if there is some URL data, which we're going to create right here, and that's going to be equal to data.get URL. So that should be one of the keys in the dictionary that we get back from data. So if that actually exists, we're going to also make another check and say if URL data at the index of status is equal to seven, then we're going to shorten the link. And the reason I decided to use seven is because in the documentation, you also have this section here for URL statuses and seven is the only one that returns to us that it is okay, that we actually did something that worked. All the other statuses need to be handled separately, but if it is seven, it means we did something good and that we can continue. So if URL data is equal to seven or the status, then we can actually shorten that link. So short link of type string is going to equal URL data of short link, or we're not actually shortening anything here. We did the shortening up above when we made the request, but this checks that we actually got a valid response back. And we're going to print the link to the user. So link is going to equal, or it's going to be this over here, the short link, so the user can see it. Else, we're going to print that there was an error status. And that's just going to be the URL data at the status. So that's the simple way to create this. Now we're going to type in def main. And in here, we're going to get the link of type string. And I actually will call this input link. And that's going to equal input, enter a link. And then we want to shorten that link. So we'll enter that input link. Then we'll check if name is equal to main and we'll run main. Now we can run this and test it out. And to test this out, I'm going to be using the Python website. So I'm going to enter python.org slash documentation. And as you could see, it spit out a good link for us. And if we tap on that link right there, it's going to take us back to the Python documentation. So creating a URL shortener was as simple as that, but as a homework problem for yourself, there are a lot of errors that can occur, and this doesn't handle any of them. This just handles what happens if it is successful, but sometimes this is going to throw some errors. So you might want to include some try and accept blocks, and also, if you go back to the API documentation, you'll see that there's a lot of other statuses. Try to make it so that you handle all of these because I guarantee you, you will run into these. And the last thing to note is that at the bottom of the documentation, it tells you your limits for your account. With a free account, you can only create 30 per month, so it's quite limited, but that's just one more thing to keep in mind with your URL shortener. We knew a guy named Bali. He was a Sikh, an Indian Sikh from Punjabis. So he had a, he was a lawyer, probably 50,000 pounds a year. 
and he drove a 400 thousand pound ferrari bali how do you have all this money how do you get these fancy cars when you're just a, a lawyer you're relatively young he was like 26 27 he said you white people are stupid so your father may have five sons and five sons will all move out of the family home they'll pay five rents probably to people like me marry five different women and never see each other again he see my father had five sons now i'm a lawyer my, my brother's a dentist my father's an engineer my other brother owns a construction company one of the and every single skill set that they needed to, to flourish was within the household so we all live in the family home we pool our resources our women work together and prepare food for us we work every time that we have uh, new children or the family is expanded we just expand the house my brother owns a construction company and that, and that way as a group we have three toyotas one ferrari and one Rolls Royce, and we can all use it anytime we want. and you know what he's a hundred percent right that is a lesson you can learn from the indians it's the one of the reasons they outcompete british people native british people in almost every single metric for a few of the projects that we will be creating later on in this course, I am going to be using Selenium. And Selenium requires that you have a driver to use it. And we're going to be using something called a Chrome driver, which will allow us to access Google Chrome through Python. But there are a few steps you have to take before you can use it. And the first one is installing Google Chrome. Then we have to make our way to a website called Chrome Driver. And here we can find the driver for our version of Chrome. But before you try to drive a Google Chrome web driver, it is important that you find the information for Google Chrome and that you locate the version number of the Google Chrome that you downloaded. So for me, I have 114.0.5735.90. These are the important numbers to memorize when you're downloading a Chrome driver. But once you memorized the driver that you have to download or the version of it, make your way back to the Chrome driver website and tap on downloads. And in downloads, you're going to want to find the version that best matches your version number. And for me, it's this one right here, 114.0.5735.90. This is the latest release. So we're going to tap on that. And then you get to select which version you want to download. If you have Linux or if you have Mac or if you have Windows, you're going to have to select the one depending on your operating system. I have a MacBook Air with the M1 chip and that requires the ARM64. But after we've downloaded that, you can go to your downloads and locate the file that you've downloaded. I removed it from my downloads file and I moved it onto my desktop. So now if we open this folder, we're going to have two different files in here. And the one we care about is the Chrome driver. Now it's important that you run both Google Chrome and this Chrome driver at least once so that you can get the permissions out of the way. On Mac, you're going to have to right click and tap on open. And it's going to ask you, are you sure you want to do this? It comes from the internet and you say yes, and it will open it in the terminal. It doesn't really matter what it says in here. It's just important that we open it at least once to get past those security measures that your computer might have. But as soon as you have this Chrome driver, grab it and drag it to your project. And I'm just going to drag it right here. It just needs to be in a place that you can access it. And in general, I would not leave it in my project. I would leave it somewhere on my computer and copy the path to it. But to keep things simple, we're going to drag it directly into our project so we can use it just by referring to its name. So now we've followed all of these four steps and we can get started with creating a sample app, which is going to tell us whether we've installed it correctly or not. So we need to first import time and then we're going to import from Selenium, which we did not install yet. So we need to open up the terminal as well and type in pip install Selenium. And once that's downloaded, the error will go away. So we can just close this and we can type in import web driver. Then from selenium.webdriver.chrome.service we're going to import the service. And those are the imports we need. Then we're going to create a class called browser. And the browser is going to contain an initializer. And the initializer is going to take one parameter, which is going to be a driver of type string. Then we can type in self.service is going to equal to the service with the driver. And self.browser is going to equal a webdriver.chrome and the service 
is going to equal the self.service. So we're just passing everything into the browser, which we want to use, of course. Then we can create a method called open page. And here we'll say uh, URL of type string, because that's the page we want to open. We'll print a friendly message that says opening and we'll pass in the URL and we will call self.browser.get and we will pass in that URL. I also want to add a friendly message up here that says starting up so we can tell if our program is doing anything. And finally, one more method, which will be called close browser because we don't want to have a lot of browsers open for no reason. So he'll print closing browser and self.browser.close. Now we can actually play around with this browser. If name is equal to main, we're going to type in browser, which is going to be an instance of browser. And we need to pass in our Chrome driver, which is in our project folder. So we will have no problem referring to it. And with our Chrome driver, we can type in browser dot open page, and we're going to pass in a URL https colon double slash www.python.org just to test it out. And it looks like I made a small typo here, so it should be python.org, of course, and we'll provide a time.sleep of five seconds. So now let's run the program and see what happens. So it says starting up, and then if we go to our main page, you'll see that it actually loaded python.org, and that will tell you whether you've installed it correctly or not. There is one thing I would like to mention, and that is it looks like we don't need the close browser method. It looks like there's been a recent update in Selenium that closes the browser for you automatically. But in the past, I was required to call browser.close at the end to make sure that everything closes correctly. Otherwise, you'll have Google Chrome open in a thousand windows at the bottom. So in any case, if Google Chrome does not close for you down here or on Windows, wherever your tabs are, just call browser.closebrowser to stop anything from happening. For example, we can make it prematurely close the program by adding another sleep here. So time.sleep, let's say five more seconds. And this will close the browser before the program has finished. So if we run this, You'll see that it's starting up. It's going to load the web page. It's going to stay there for five seconds, and then it's going to close it manually, even before the program has finished. But it looks like they updated it to finish or close the browser as soon as the script has terminated, which I think is quite cool. I didn't know about that. But anyways, now you have the Chrome driver set up so we can use it for a few projects in the near future. Goal. Goal. To be a billionaire. 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 A very famous billionaire. Okay. <laughs> Wish you luck. In this Python project, we're going to be creating a script which scrapes emails from any URL. So for this example, I have a website that actually generates random emails. And what we want to do, of course, is take those 50 emails from the web page and save it as a list inside our script so we can do whatever we want with that information later. So if you have a lot of websites, you can scrape as many emails as you want. Now, if we run this test scraper, you'll see that it's going to start up the browser in uh, what they call headless mode, which means we're not going to open the browser with Selenium as usual, but we are going to still open it in silent mode. So it's gonna be minimized and it's actually not even going to show up. So it's pretty cool because it looks like we didn't open any browser but we actually did so that we could load the JavaScript and load these emails and scrape them. So if we actually go to this website, you'll see it generates 50 random email addresses. And if we refresh that, it will generate them again. So the first thing we have to do is create a new empty project. And it's important that you have your Chrome driver for this project to work. In case you don't have it, go to the setup section of this course because I explain it there how you can download Selenium and how you can set up your Chrome driver. Otherwise, we can get rid of this default script, make this a bit smaller and open up the terminal so we can pip install Selenium. Then we're going to close that and make this slightly bigger. Now to validate emails, we're going to have to import regex. 
regex just makes it easy to follow some patterns. So for example, if we see some sort of at symbol followed by .com, regex is going to be able to recognize that. Then we are going to import from typing the final type. And we also need to import some very specific functionality from Selenium. So from Selenium import WebDriver, then from selenium.webdriver.chrome.options. We want to import options and we're just going to duplicate that line and change the last two to service and service. Next, what I'm about to paste in is a regex pattern. And this can be found on my GitHub repository, which is located, of course, in the resource section of this lesson. And this is regex. As you can see, it's a lot of symbols that don't really make sense to us, but that will help us recognize patterns that match emails. And regex isn't something you have to learn by heart. As you can see, there is so much that doesn't make sense there. All that's important is that you find a working regex expression online. You can type it on Google. You'll see that there are thousands of them in case you want to find phone numbers or if you want to find emails or if you want to find something else, you will always be able to find a regex expression written online. So you don't ever have to create this by scratch. But let's continue with our program and create a class called browser. And this class is going to need an initializer which will take a driver of type string. And we have a lot of attributes to initialize. But first we will type in starting up browser. And next we can type in self dot Chrome options is going to equal the options so that we can add some options such as making that headless browser because it's annoying to open up a browser each time we run the script. So we want to run it without the browser. And to do that, we'll type in self dot Chrome options dot add argument. And the argument we have to add is a flag that says headless. And that's going to prevent the browser from showing. And there are a few arguments you can add to speed up your program. So for example, you can add something such as disable extensions. If you don't want Google Chrome to run any extensions, that will save some time. And also disable GPU. You don't have to include these if it's running fast enough, but it can help you save some time. Then under that, we need to create a service. So self.service is going to equal a service that takes our driver and the browser. So self.browser is going to equal a web driver dot Chrome uppercase. And it's going to take the service of type service or self.service and the options, which are going to be self.options or Chrome options. Below that, we need to create a function that scrapes the emails. So def scrape emails, and it's going to take self, and this is actually supposed to be outside. So we'll get there. And it's going to take a URL to scrape, and it's going to return to us a set. And the reason we're returning a set is because we don't want to get duplicates back. And a set is a very efficient way of removing duplicates from a list or from anything. So we can print scraping URL for emails. Then we will open the browser by calling self.browser and get with the URL. We also want to get the page source back. So we'll type in page source, which will be of type string. And that's going to equal self.browser.page source. And you should call this after you've loaded the browser or the URL. So we can actually get that source code back. But right below that, we're going to type in list of emails and that's going to be of type set and it's going to equal an empty set. Now for regex match in regex dot find iter, we're going to insert the email regex. So it's going to scan the page source for everything and it's going to return to us some emails if there are any. So list of emails dot append or dot add actually because we are using a set and we're going to add that regex match dot group. And at the bottom, we want to return the list of emails. And as always, we're going to create a function called close browser, we might not use it or we might use it eventually, but it's good to have it. So here we'll type in uh, closing browser, followed by self dot browser dot close. Outside of this class, we can 
type in main, or actually we're going to create a function called main to keep our code tidy. And we need to create a driver of type string, which is going to be equal to your driver path. Right now I have Chrome driver in my main folder. So all I have to do is type in Chrome driver and it will refer to this one over here. And the browser is going to equal a browser with the driver set to the driver. And for the emails that we want to scrape, which will be emails of type set, we're going to create a browser dot scrape emails and we need to insert the URL that we want to scrape the emails from. And to test it, I have this link here. So again, it generates 50 different email addresses for us to scrape. And we can actually list those out by typing in for I and email in enumerate emails at the start of one. Then we can print I email with the separator being this colon and a space. Then all that's left for us to do is to actually run it. So if name is equal to main, we will run main, format it and tap on run. It's going to start up the browser. And if everything goes good, we should get 50 emails back that we can use. And as you can see, it's scraping this URL for emails. If you insert a website that doesn't have any emails on the web page, it's not going to return anything back to you. It's going to return actually nothing. So as a homework problem, I want you to create a message saying that there were no emails. And as an alternative homework problem, you can create another regex pattern that actually recognizes phone numbers and other information from websites. All that's important is that you play around with the RE match in re.findita because you can create a lot of different patterns. You can even just duplicate this, change this to let's say uh, phone numbers. So scrape numbers, add the rejects for phone numbers here and scrape some phone numbers as well. But as you can see, if we just print the emails that we scrape, it's going to return everything to us as a set. And since this was empty, we didn't get anything back, of course. So let's uh, so let's populate that list with something cool, such as 50 emails. And if we run it one more time, we should get 50 emails put inside a set. Unless it contains duplicates, then we will have less. But we managed to scrape the emails from this website using our script. The yeah. difference is we are a three and a half trillion dollar economy. Why is Tim Cook coming here when to, in 2016 he, he didn't? Because now I, India has $6 billion of revenue for iPhones. Why is Samsung, Foxconn setting up plants? Because we tried the same policies in 2016-17. And we said, if you want to sell in India, you have to make in India. Otherwise, we'll have all, all these high custom duties, which is what we are mm -hmm. telling Tesla right yeah. now. They all said, okay, bye. We are not coming to India. That's what Tesla is saying because the market for Tesla is not big enough here, right? But look at Tata, what is that uh, Exxon or whatever that EV is it's selling well. So you have to price. So the point is once your domestic market has deepened, all these things fall into place. Let's create a bot that can recognize our sentiments or actually perform sentiment analysis on what we write. So the project is going to look like this as soon as we run it we'll have a bot that says enter some text and I'll perform a sentiment analysis on it. So here we can say, I am happy. And the bot should give you this sentiment analysis followed by the polarity rating. And if we can say this sucks, we will get a mad face because that is the sentiment of what we wrote. We can also say, what a beautiful day. I won the lotto we will get a fairly positive rating. Or we can say, I feel okay. And there it saw that it's just a average polarity rating. So it's going to rate it as neutral. But the sentiment analysis bot is just a fun way to show you how sentiment analysis can be done. So let's create this from scratch. And the first thing you want to do is pip install text blob. And text blob is a package that provides a lot of cool functionality for dealing with text and sentiments and a lot of cool things like that. So let's import from text blob the text blob class. And we're going to import from data classes the data class because we're going to create a very minimalistic data class that contains a mood. So at data class, 
we're going to create a class called mood and it's going to contain an emoji of type string and a sentiment of type float. And to get the sentiment, we're going to create a function called get mood, which will take some input text of type string and we're going to provide an asterisk here so that we're forced to use this argument or this parameter by its name. So sensitivity of type float. And that's going to return to us a mood. Now to get the polarity, we're going to create a variable called polarity and it's going to be of type float, which will use text blob with the input text and it's going to get the sentiment.polarity back. Then we need to create some thresholds. So here we can type in friendly threshold of type float and that's going to equal the sensitivity. So essentially the sensitivity is how sensitive the bot should be when we insert some text. For example, I wrote, I am happy and that gave us a score of 0.8, which is quite a high rating because this ranges from negative one to one and eight is quite high in that respect. The mid range is zero and that will return neutral. So what we're doing with the sensitivity is telling the bot which part is neutral and which part is happy and which part is sad or upset or negative. So by default, I'm going to set this to 0.3 because I think 0.3 is a good rating. If it's above 0.3, it's going to be positive. If it's below negative 0.3, it's going to be negative. But anything between negative 0.3 and positive 0.3 is going to be considered neutral. So here let's duplicate this and call this the hostile threshold, which is just going to be the negative version of the friendly threshold. Next, if the polarity is more than or equal to the friendly threshold, we're going to return a good mood. So return a mood that says good and it will contain the polarity. And personally, I really like having this bot with emojis. So if you want to insert those there, feel more than welcome to do so. L if the polarity is less than or equal to the hostile threshold, we're going to return an angry mood. So here we'll add angry and the polarity rating again. Else it's just going to be a neutral mood. So return the mood of neutral face with the polarity. So this is the function we will use to get the mood of the message. Now let's create a function called run bot and the bot will say something such as enter some text to get a sentiment analysis. And we will insert a while true loop, which will take the user input of type string, which will equal an input of you. And the mood of type mood is going to equal get mood with the user input and the sensitivity set to 0.3. Now, because we defined this asterisk, we cannot pass it in as 0.3 because the program is going to say, hey, it's an unexpected argument. We're forcing ourselves to actually include the keyword sensitivity so that the programmer can actually see this. And that's just supposed to be a way of being more explicit with your program or forcing other people to be more explicit because some people might not really understand what user input and 0.3 means. So when they include sensitivity, it's just easier to remember and we want to force them to do that. Then we will print that the bot said mood.emoji and mood.sentiment. Then all we have to do is run the bot. So run bot. And just like that, we can tap on run and we're going to have a script that analyzes our text. So we can say, I am super happy today. And it's going to give us a rather positive rating. Otherwise, if we say, I hate my life, we should get a negative rating back. I hate my life usually, but today I am very happy. And it might struggle with certain phrases because again, this is very confusing for the algorithm. We wrote a lot of words that were negative, but we also had a rather positive thing to say at the end. So you are going to have to play around with this to get better responses, but that's the concept behind how you can create a sentiment analysis bot. That is a cool dog and it's rather positive. Also, if we put a higher value for the sensitivity, you're going to notice that the bot is going to give you neutral more times. So I am good today. It's still going to cut it. So let's actually raise that to 0.8. We can type that again. I am good today. 
and it's going to rate that as neutral because it has to be above or equal to 0.8 to return happy. Or if you want to say something such as I am bad, it also has to be below negative 0.8 to actually register as a negative sentiment. So depending on how sensitive you want it, 0.1 being super sensitive and 0.9 being extremely insensitive, that's up to you. It is difficult to stay disengaged from the outcome. We can hope for an outcome, but we cannot plan it. And that's the biggest lesson I have learned to be in the process so that the process itself becomes the outcome and becomes the result of what you're aspiring to do. Thank you. In this project, we're going to be creating a crypto alerter. So what does a crypto alerter do? Well, we're going to specify which cryptocurrencies we want to keep track of. And we're also going to specify the bottom and the top price that we want to keep track of. So in case Bitcoin decides to go above 20,000 or falls under 10 euros for whatever reason, we're going to receive an alert. And thanks to that alert, you're going to be able to execute certain functionality. But if we run this script right now, you'll see that we're following Bitcoin, Ethereum and Ripple. And with that, we have the current prices of each one of them. So since Bitcoin is over 24,000 and we specified a top of 20K, it's going to trigger the trigger. And the same thing goes for Ethereum. It's above 1700, which means we get the trigger. As soon as we change the top range for our alert to, let's say, 1900, you'll notice that Ethereum will no longer be triggered. And we can also change the bottom to under 1800 and the trigger will come back because we triggered either a bottom price or a top price and both of those are going to execute functionality. So to get started, create a new empty project and inside your project folder, we are going to create another file called crypto data because we're going to try to organize this project a bit better. Then anywhere in your project, open up the terminal and type in pip install requests because we need to make a request to an API to get the live cryptocurrency data back. Next, let's import requests. And we're also going to import from data classes, the data class. And finally, we will import final. Now, the first thing I want to include is a base URL of type final of type string. And this is going to be a constant, of course. And the constant I will include will be this URL, a URL that takes us to an API from CoinGecko. And this API is going to allow us to make free requests to coin data. It's going to look like this when we actually call it, except here I did use an extra argument called versus currency, which is Euro. And that is required for that to work. You can also put USD or a different currency, but it's going to return to us a lot of cryptocurrencies based on their market size. Anyway, we're going to be using this URL and you can find that in the resource section of this lecture. With that being done, we can create a data class. So at data class and inside the data class, we want to create something called a coin. And this is going to represent our cryptocurrency. And it's going to have a lot of attributes such as the name of type string, the symbol of type string, the current price of type float, the high price of 24 hours of type float, the low price of 24 hours, and that's also of type float. Then we also have the price change in 24 hours, of course, of type float, and finally price change percentage of 24 hours. And we will also change that to change and that will conclude our coin class. For this project, we're really only going to be using these three, but I also wanted to show you that you can use these if you want to make a much more complex cryptocurrency alerter. And we will also include a string method. So def string, and that's going to return the formatted string of self or self dot name with self dot symbol. And that's going to be for euros and the self.current price 
and that's going to be formatted with the colon and the comma. You can add your own currency here. I'm going to show you later where you add your own currency so you can display it in a currency you understand. But under this data class, we're going to create one function that retrieves the coin data. And this one's going to be called get coins, which of course returns to us a list of coin. Next, we're going to want to define a payload of type dictionary. These are the queries we want to put into the URL. So one that we want to define, for example, is going to be the versus currency. So it's going to be Bitcoin to Euro. Otherwise, you can enter your own country currency. If that doesn't exist, unfortunately, you're going to have to create your own converter, which will convert from Euro or from USD to your current currency. Next, we have to pick the order of how we want to get the data back from the API, and I'm going to get it in market cap descending. So that is the payload that we're going to put into our API request. Then we have the data, which is equal to requests.get, and we want to insert the base URL, and the parameters are going to be equal to the payload. Then the JSON of type dictionary is going to equal data.json. Next, we're going to get the data from the JSON. So for example, we're going to print, or not print, we're going to create a coin list, and it's going to be of list of type coin, which will equal an empty list, then for item in JSON, we're going to create a new coin. And this new coin is going to be called current coin. And that's going to be of type coin, which will equal a coin. And all that's left for us to do inside here is to fill out the information from our data class. So for example, the name is going to be equal to item.get and we want to get the name. Then we want to do the same thing for the symbol. So symbol is going to be item dot get and we want to get the symbol and then you're going to want to do it for the current price the high 24 the low 24 the price change 24 and the price change percentage for 24 hours i decided to name the fields of the data class the same as the fields you'll find in the api and if we make our way over to the api you'll see that if we make a request we're going to have these fields such as high underscore 24 low underscore 24 we also have the current price and all the fields that I included here exist in the API. You can add more if you want. If you want to have, let's say, the date or something else, you can include that in your data class up here and you can get it and include it inside your coin. But once you get a coin and you append it to your coin list, you're going to want to return that coin or return the coins list. So for example, return coins list. Or I actually did not append the current coin. So coin list dot append current coin. Then we can create our if name is equal to main check and we can do a test with our get coins function. So here we can say that coins are equal to get coins and then we can create a for loop. So for coin in coins print coin. And just like that, we can test it by tapping on run. And if we open up our terminal or our console, you'll see that we have all the cryptocurrencies with market cap descending, starting with Bitcoin, Ethereum, Tether, BNB, USD coin, and so on. It shows us the name, the currency symbol, and the current price in euros. And there are a lot of them. But now that we can actually retrieve the coins, we can move on to our main script, which actually deals with creating the alert. So inside here, we're going to import from crypto data, get coins and the coin. And that's all we're going to use because that's actually all we have from crypto data to use. But with that, we can create the function called alert, which is going to take a symbol of type string, a bottom price of type float, a top price of type float, and a coins list of type list of coin. Inside here, we're going to check for coin in coins list if the coin dot symbol is equal to the symbol we specified, then we're going to use that for our alert. If the coin dot current price is more than the top price, or if the coin dot current price is less than the bottom price, then we're going to trigger some sort of action. So for this example, we're going to trigger that the coin got triggered. 
So this section here of the if block is exactly where you would want to set up your own functionality. And I'm not going to be teaching you how to trade cryptocurrency using Python in this video, but this is one way to actually set it up. Then you're going to have to use a different API or a different method to actually execute the conversion or the trade. Else, if it was not triggered, we're just going to print the coin as it is without this triggered block. And just like that, we can create another if name is equal to main check and type in coins of type list of coin is going to equal get coins. Then let's create an alert. We can say an alert of Bitcoin and the bottom is going to be uh, 20K while the top is going to be 28K and the coins list is going to equal the coins. And just like that, we can actually run this script and you'll see that Bitcoin is going to pop up in the console, but it hasn't triggered anything. So it's not going to say triggered. But as soon as we change that to 24K, we're going to get triggered back. And we're going to create the same thing for Ethereum and Ripple. So Ethereum and Ripple is XRP. So we have these three now and Ripple is extremely weak. So I'm going to copy and paste my previous values for that. And for Ethereum, I'm going to put 1800 followed by 1900. So those are now the values I have for these currencies. And if we rerun the program, you'll see that both Ethereum and Bitcoin were triggered, but Ripple wasn't because it's supposed to be XRP. And once you have the correct name, it's going to also show that currency. And in general, you wouldn't run this script each time you wanted to create an alert. You would have a while true loop followed by some sort of delay because you don't want to run this every single second, but you will want to run it, let's say every 30 seconds. So you can say time dot sleep 30 seconds. For this example, I'll type in five to simulate that time passes. So you can see this refreshing over and over. So if we run this, it's going to sleep for five seconds then it's going to show you or display to you the current prices. And then in another five seconds, it's going to update it and display you the prices again. If I remember correctly, the CoinGecko API refreshes the values every 30 or 60 seconds. So it doesn't really make sense to refresh it every five seconds. I would leave it at 30 or 60 because right now we're just wasting resources. But just like that, we created a crypto alerter in Python. If we do not it's a good, big challenge now. In this project, we're going to be creating a custom public API. Right now, I am running it locally on my local machine, but I will later show you how you can combine that with a URL so that your friends or colleagues can use it to use your API. So the project's going to look like this. Right now, if we run it locally, we're going to get some data back and we're just going to get the date and some sort of phrase back. If I refresh this, we might get a different phrase and the time or date is going to update. We're also going to look at how we can add endpoints to add extra functionality. For example, we can say API slash random. And if we tap on enter, we're going to get a random number in the range of 100. Plus we get some default text back. So we're getting a lot of information back that we can use for a project. We can also specify a number so we can say something such as question mark number and the number is going to be, let's say 1000 and or 10,005. If we tap on enter, it's now going to be the input for the random sequence. And we can also define some text so we can say and text equals hello world. And it's going to update it here. So we are effectively adding inputs to the API to get some responses back. So let's get started immediately with creating this bot in Python and I'll increase the font size just a bit. And we're going to have to open up the terminal because we need to use a framework called Flask to actually create these endpoints. So pip install Flask. And then we can just close this console. Then from Flask, we're going to import Flask and request. Then from random, we're going to import random integer and choice. And finally, from date time, we're going to import date time to get the current date and time. Now our app name is going to be flask underscore underscore name. 
So to create an endpoint, we need to use this decorator that says app dot root, and we need to define the endpoint. So this will be the home page since we're just using a slash. And in general, I would call this one index. Just like when you're working with web development, you have an index page, which in general would be the home page. And all we're going to do in here is return a random phrase to the user, plus of course, the current date. So phrases, list of string, and that's going to equal a choice from the following list of phrases. And I don't want to write out these phrases again, because it's straightforward, but it's going to contain three different phrases. And actually, we're going to remove choice from that. So as you can see, we have welcome to this page, you're looking good today, and the weather is great. Then we're going to return a dictionary, which is going to be passed to JSON. So here we're going to add phrase, and that's going to be equal to choice of phrases. So we're always going to return a random phrase to spice things up a bit. And the date is just going to be datetime.now. So that is the first endpoint we have. And you can actually play around with that immediately. You can say if name is equal to main app.run. And if you tap on this green arrow, it's going to start a server or a development server in the console, which runs on your local host. So if you tap on that, you'll see that you'll get a response back immediately. And you can refresh the page to see that it's actually working as many times as you want. So that was the first endpoint we created, but we want to make it a bit more complex so that you can actually create your own with more functionality. So we can close this for now. And here we're going to create another app route. So app route. And this time we're going to define the endpoint to be slash API slash random. And we're going to create this as random. Now this endpoint is going to be in charge of giving the user back a random number and whatever text they inserted. So here we'll type in number input, and that's going to equal request dot arguments dot get. And we want to get the argument of number and that's going to be of type integer. So we want this to try to pass it to integer. Otherwise, we're also going to have a default of 100 in case they decide not to include it. So here we can type in also text input. So I can show you that you can also take text and we'll type in request dot arguments dot get. And here we're just going to have text followed by the type which should be of type string and default which will be set to default text in case the user enters nothing. If the number is an instance of integer, so number input is instance of integer, and all that does is check that number is of type int, then we can continue with returning data. Because if the user enters text where the number is supposed to be, that's not going to be of type integer. So we shouldn't allow the program to do any calculation, then we can return that the input, whatever the user input is the number input. the random is the random integer from zero to number input, the text will be whatever text the user decides to input. And finally, we're going to include the date, which is date time dot now. And if it is not an instance of integer, we're just going to return error, please only enter numbers. So now we have our second endpoint. And if we tap on run again, and go back to our development server, we can now experiment with that we can do slash API slash random and tap on enter and we're going to get back the response that we created. So input is by default 100 and text by default is default text. Otherwise, if we say question mark number equals potato, it's going to default to 100 because this did not pass to an integer. So it failed and gave us a default input. But in the off chance that you don't want that to happen, you can get rid of the default. So you can do this and you can rerun the program. And the next time you do that, you should get an error. So now you're effectively getting an error because the type you inserted was not correct. So this default is good if you want the user to be able to use your API no matter what text they enter, but it might be better to handle that with the error. So I'm going to remove that in this example, because if the user enters something and doesn't get an error, they're going to be confused why they got such a weird result. Like getting 100 for entering potato is not a common result. 
So raising an error is just a better scenario for that case. And we should also test, so that equals, let's say 100 and text equals hello. So text works as well, but how do we host this publicly? Well, we're going to be using a website called Python Anywhere. So the first thing we have to do is sign up for an account. And I'm just going to tap on login so that I can sign up here. Now we're going to create a beginner account because it's absolutely free. And I'm just going to quickly create an account. So I'm going to use this email here. And the username will be this is for testing purposes. And then I'm going to make up my password and I'm going to tap on I agree and register. Then I'm going to tap on end tour. And what you want to do is tap on web. Then we will add a new web app and we're going to tap on next. And here you'll see that we can pick a web framework. So we'll tap on flask. So the latest version they have here is 3.10, which means if you use any features from 3.11, it's not going to work but we didn't use any features from 3.11 yet. So it's perfectly fine. We'll deal with 3.10 and we'll just tap on next. And it's going to give us a quick start Flask project, which is live and online. Then it's going to take you to this page. And as you can see, we have the website URL and this is where we will host our API. But before we can see our API or actually use it, we're going to have to scroll down to the code section and go to the directory of it then you'll see we'll have a file called flaskapp.py. And in here we'll have the basic setup for a Flask application. But all we have to do is paste in our Flask application and remove the if name is equal to main check because it's going to run it for us automatically. Then you can tap on save and you want to refresh the website. So here tap on this refresh symbol. Then we can tap here and go back to web. And this time we can tap on this URL and we're going to have our API hosted on this URL here. And it's going to work exactly the same way as when we created it locally. So now we can do API slash random, and that's going to equal, or we actually have to add the question mark and say number equals 100. And we'll get a response back for that. And text equals hello. And we'll get a response back for that as well. We will still get the error if we enter something it doesn't understand. It will say, please enter numbers only. So that is our API. It is live on Python anywhere, but this will only stay live for three months if you don't click on this button within that time frame. So theoretically, you can have this up and running free forever as long as you remember to tap on this at least once every three months. It's going to extend the validity of this website by three months. So, I mean, that's not something too hard to remember if you want to play around with the free version. But let's copy our URL, or let's actually just go forward and copy our URL, because now we can actually use it in Python. We can get rid of this script since we're not using it anymore, and we can import requests, which we need to install, of course. So install package requests. Then we can do something very dirty. We can type in request equals requests.get and we're going to get the data for our URL. Then the data is going to equal the request.json and we're just going to print the data. So if we run that, we're going to get the response from our API. And this is super cool because now we can share this link with our friends and they can use it as well, of course. So your homework will be to make this much more interesting, create some dummy data for your API, create some more advanced functions so that you can actually share it with someone and they will be able to use that functionality just by using your endpoint or your URL. What is the purpose of thinking? What is the purpose of thinking? Now, if you ask that question to a brain scientist, the brain scientist will say, well, the purpose of thinking is to stop thinking. The purpose of thinking is to stop thinking. Now, what does she mean by that? Well, here's the thing. Thinking is a high energy activity. It takes a lot of energy to think. So whenever we think, we try to think as short as possible, and then we return to automatic pilot. Over 95% of our life, we run on automatic pilot. For example, if you've ever driven a car and then you realize, whoa, what did I do in the past half an hour? That's your brain on automatic pilot. For this project, we're going to be creating a habit tracker in Python. 
And it's going to look like this as soon as we run it, we're going to get this beautiful chart in the console that tells us the name of the habit that we're quitting, the time since we quit it, the remaining days to actually conquer quitting our habit, the time in minutes saved from using that habit. For example, coffee might take you five minutes per day. So up to this point, we saved 22 minutes and the money saved on doing that habit. For example, coffee can cost you maybe two euros, three euros per day. And here we have 15 euros saved after four days. Being lazy is an expensive habit, so we saved over 2,000 euros in the past two years. And you'll see also that once we get past the 60-day habit-breaking period, we will have text that displays cleared because we broke that habit. And we'll be able to add and remove as many elements as we want, but that's the entire project, and it can be something really cool if you have some sort of habit you're trying to quit. So let's get started immediately by creating a new empty project. And I'm just going to delete all of that and create another file. And the other file is going to be called Habit Tracker. And this will contain the model and the functionality of the habits. So inside here, we need to import from date time, date time. And we also need to import from data classes, the data class. Because I want to create a habit or a class for our habit. And the class is going to be called Habit. And this will contain a name for the habit of type string, the time since we quit that habit of type string, the remaining days, remaining days of type string, the minutes saved, which will be of type float, and the money saved, which will be of type string. So those are the fields of our habit. Then we want to create a function called track habit, so we can keep track of the habit we are following, and that will take a parameter called name, of type string, then a start for that habit when we started it, which will be of type date time, and the cost of that habit per day. So float and minutes used each day for that habit, minutes used of type float. And all of this will return to us a habit. I guess we don't need the sidebar in this moment, so we'll close that. At the top, we're going to define a goal of type integer which is going to be set to 60 days initially, however long it takes to destroy a habit or to get rid of a habit, enter those amount of days there so that we have something to count down from. And then you can enter your hourly wage. So you can say hourly wage is equal to, for example, 30 euros an hour so that we can calculate how much money we actually save by quitting that habit. Next, we need to get the time elapsed. So time elapsed of type floats is going to equal date time dot now minus the start date time. And we want to get the total seconds back from that. And this should actually be instantiated. So that's going to give us the total time elapsed in seconds. Then we want to convert that to hours. So I'll type hours of type float. And we're going to round the time elapsed divided by 60 divided by 60. And we want to round that to one decimal place. And days of type float are going to equal round hours divided by 24 to two decimal places. Next, the money saved of type float is going to equal the cost times the days. The minutes used type float are going to equal round days times minutes used. So we're doing a lot of math here. And the total money saved, because we want to combine both of them, is going to be of type string. And I'm going to write formatted string with the euro. And here I can interpolate by adding the curly brackets and say money saved plus parentheses minutes used divided by 60 times my hourly wage. This should be minutes used. And then we will highlight this and round it to two decimal places. And I'll quickly add some comments here to make it look a bit more detailed. So we have convert timestamp into hours and days, and we have some random bonus details. Next, we have the amount of days remaining until we actually break the habit. So we will create a variable called days to go of type float or string, and that's going to equal round goal minus days. Then we want to create some displayable information. 
And when I say displayable, I mean we're going to return it as a string in a nice format. So remaining days of type string is going to equal cleared if days to go is less than or equal to zero. Else we're going to print the formatted string of days to go. And we also want to return the time since. So time since is going to be of type string and that's going to equal the formatted string of days, days if hours are greater than 72. Because we don't want to count in hours the whole time, eventually we want to convert to days. And I made a quick typo in time since, so I'll fix that. And here we'll type in else, we're going to return hours, hours. So that's all the math and calculations that we have to do to create a habit. Now we just need to return that habit. So return habit with the following parameters, name, which will be equal to name, time since, which will be equal to time since, remaining days will be equal to remaining days, minutes saved are going to be equal to minutes used, and money saved is going to equal total money saved. And that's going to take care of the functionality we need to create a habit. Now for the second part, we're going to navigate to main.py and we're going to open up the terminal because we need to install pandas since we want to use some data frame functionality. And once we've installed that, we're also going to pip install tabulate, which allows us to create beautiful tables inside our console. Then we can import pandas as PD. And then from tabulate, we're going to import tabulate from date time, we're going to import date time. And from habit tracker, we're going to import track habit and the habit type. Next, we can create some habits. So we're going to create a main function and the habits are going to be of type list of habit, which are just going to be a list of habits. And the first one we're going to call track habit and we're going to say we want to quit coffee and the time or the start time is going to be a date time. And here you have the option to insert the year, month, day, hour and minute, and even second microsecond. And you can get very specific as you can see. So right now we are in 2023. The month is the sixth month and today's the seventh day. We'll say we quit yesterday. So we'll put six, six and we quit yesterday at eight in the morning. The minutes don't matter in this case, so we'll leave it like that. Then the cost we'll say is one euro per day and the minutes used on making that coffee takes me about five minutes per morning. So we have one habit so far and we're just going to test it with one at the moment. So first we need to create a data frame, which is going to be a PD dot data frame from those habits. Then with that data frame, we can print tabulate and we're going to have to insert a data frame here and the headers are going to be the keys of the data class. And we also should specify a table format, which is going to be PSQL. Then let's run this real quick to see what happens. Now I will tap on run and the startup time will take long the first time you do it. It has to generate the graph. But as you can see, we now have coffee because I didn't spell coffee correctly inside our chart. So we are effectively saving money and slowly quitting our habit. Let's change this to coffee and let's change the month to five. So now if we run this, it's going to change to 32 days with 28 days remaining. And this is how much time and money I saved just in one month. Otherwise, let's go back, let's say three months. So we'll change this to three. And we should have cleared inside remaining days, we successfully conquered that habit. And we saved this much time and it's going to continue counting it so we can always see how much money we saved. And there's actually one silly thing I did here. And that is put the euros inside parentheses. So I will go back to the data class. And I'm going to change that as soon as I find it, which is right here. So we'll get rid of those parentheses, rerun the program. And that is gone. But let's add another habit because we're here already. So why not? And what's something else I want to quit? Let's say let's quit wasting time. 
and I quit that, uh, let's say in 2023, and we'll put the sixth month, and today I guess is the seventh. I will say I quit wasting time at six in the morning. Cost is 100 euros per day, and the minutes used are around 12 hours, so 60 times 12. So I stopped wasting time at six this morning, and right now it's around nine, so you'll see three hours in the console. And I saved 60 euros since I quit it just three hours ago, which is great. I feel rich again. Or we can do something more realistic, such as quit smoking. And we can say that happened uh, two days ago. So on the sixth month, on the fifth day, and the cost is actually quite expensive. I don't smoke, but if I did, I imagine it would be around 15 euros per day in Denmark. And minutes used, if you smoke in general, I guess it's every hour you would smoke or every hour and a half. So I'm going to say around half an hour wasted on smoking per day. So there we go. I quit smoking since 51 hours. Now I have 58 more days until I conquer this habit. The time I saved so far is around one hour and I saved 63 euros in just two days. So that's insane. And as you can see, you can add as many habits as you want. So it's a very simple project that looks really cool because you actually get to visualize data in the console. So play around with it, have fun with it, and of course experiment with it because that's how you learn to actually program in Python. Some of the most successful people in the world are the ones who've had the most failures. J.K. Rawlings, who wrote Harry Potter. Her first Harry Potter book was rejected 12 times before it was finally published. Michael Jordan was cut from his high school basketball team. He lost hundreds of games and missed thousands of shots during his career, but he once said, I have failed over and over and over again in my life, and that's why I succeed. These people succeeded because they understood that you can't let your failures define you. You have to let your failures teach you. You have to let them show you what to do differently the next time. So if you get into trouble, that doesn't mean you're a troublemaker. It means you need to try harder to act right. If you get a bad grade, that doesn't mean you're stupid. It just means you need to spend more time studying. No one's born being good at all things. You become good at things through hard work. For this project, we're going to be creating a script that predicts values using machine learning. So it's going to work like this. We're going to have an input such as years, and we're going to also get some past data from those years. So for example, I made, let's say, a thousand euros the first year, I made 800 euros the second year, on the third year, I made 2000 euros and so on. We're getting some sort of pattern going. And what I want to know is what's going to happen in 15 years. What will my salary look like in 15 years? And to do that, we're going to use machine learning and linear regression. It's going to use that machine learning and it's going to spit out a prediction along with the accuracy rating of that prediction. And we can also set the number to something much further, such as 30. What's my salary going to look like in 30 years? if we follow this data. If we run the script again, we'll see that in 30 years or on the 30th year, I'll be making 14,000 euros. And we also have a way of showing this on a plot so we can actually see what we are doing. So if I set the plot here to true, it's going to drag us over to our main window and it's going to show us a plot of the data that we've input. So this is the line that it is following based on these inputs. The dots are the inputs, so those are the years, and the outputs are the salary. So as you can see, it made a line that fits this data quite well. Anyway, this is a great project for getting into machine learning. So let's get started immediately by creating a new empty project. So once you create an empty project, open up your project folder and create a new Python file. And this one's going to be called model because we want to model our data. And we're going to import from data classes, the data class, so that we can type at data class, and we can create a prediction class. So prediction, and the prediction is going to hold a value of type float, it's going to contain an R2 score, which I'll explain later, of type float, it will have a slope of type float, an intercept, type float, and a mean absolute error of type float. And we will create a string representation that will say return 
f prediction with the self dot value formatted to two decimal places. And that's also going to contain the R2 score. So self dot R2 score, and that will be formatted to 0.2%. So it's going to give us a percentage back. And that's all that this model is going to contain. Then we can move on to main.py and get started with the packages. So let's open up the terminal and type in pip install sci kit slash or dash learn. And that's going to contain a lot of functionality that we need to actually get this machine learning in motion. Then we also want to install pandas. And we need to install something called mat plot library. And I believe those are the only packages we need to install to make this work. So let's close the terminal and try. So from model, we're first going to import our prediction. Then we can import stuff such as numpy as mp, import pandas as pd, which are both naming conventions, import matplotlibrary.pyplot as plt, and from sci and from sklearn.linear model, we're going to import linear regression. Then from sklearn.metrics, we can import the mean absolute error and the R2 score. And finally, from sklearn.model selection, we need to import train test split, which is used to train and test our models. Then we can create a function called make prediction. And it's going to take some inputs of list of type string, or of type float actually, and some outputs of list of type float, and an input value, which will be used to make a prediction. And this will be of type float. Then there's also whether we want to display a plot or not. And that'll be of type boolean, initially set to false, which will return to us a prediction. Then for this to actually work, the inputs must match the length of the outputs. So we're going to create a very early check to make sure that that's the case before doing anything. So if the length of inputs is equal to the length of outputs, that means we did something good, but that's actually not what I wanted. I wanted this to be not equal to. So if length of inputs is not equal to the length of outputs, then we're going to raise an exception that the length of inputs and outputs must match. So the user knows that both of these must be of the same length. Then we need to create a data frame for our data. So that's going to be a data frame, which will equal pd.dataframe. And it's going to take the inputs as inputs and the outputs as outputs. Of course, the outputs should also be the outputs from above. Then something very common in machine learning is reshaping the data using NumPy. And we're going to use two naming conventions. One is X and one is Y. X in general is used for inputs and lowercase y is used for outputs. So for example, X is going to equal a NP dot array. So a NumPy array at the data frame index of inputs but we need to reshape this data. So we will reshape it with minus one and one. And we need to do the same thing with lowercase y. So lowercase y, which will handle the outputs, will also be reshaped. And something I always encourage you to do if you don't understand what it does is just printing out what it is. So we're going to print x and y, for example, and we're just going to test this make prediction. So right now we'll enter some inputs of one and two, and outputs will be three and four. And we also need to specify input value and we don't need to do anything with the Boolean. So we're going to use that just to test this. Now, if we run the program and make this prediction, you'll see we will get this data reshaped in this kind of fashion. If we do not reshape it, for example, you'll see that we will just have a normal array, but we want to reshape it to look like this. So that's why we use this weird reshape method. 
Next, we want to split the data into training data so that we can test our model. For every time we create a model to run in machine learning, we're going to have some test data and some training data. The test data is just used to validate our model to make sure that it is accurate. So you'll see this a lot, but there will be something called train x and test x. Then we'll have train y and test y. And that's going to equal train test split with x and y as the data. We're going to provide a random state at zero and a test size of 20%, so 0 0.20. Random state just means we're going to always get that same random data back in case we want to find out where something went wrong. You can change this to any number you want, but we're going to leave it at zero. Now that we have the data split up into testing and training data, we can actually get started with making some predictions. So first we're going to create a model of linear regression because we're going to be using linear regression to make this prediction. And we're going to call model.fit. And we need to fit the train x to the train y. So that is the training data. And based on the training data, we're going to be able to make a prediction. So below that, I'll add a comment called prediction. And the y prediction, because y is the output, is going to be equal to the model.predict. And we need to create a list that is two levels deep. So two square brackets, and inside we can enter the input value, the value that we actually want to predict. Then we also need a line to display on the chart or the plot. And we're going to call this y line, which is the prediction line. So model.predict x. And that's going to give us the slope or that line that was red going through all the dots in the chart. So I'll show you that later, but we need that. Now to test for accuracy, so we'll type in testing for accuracy, we're going to create a variable called y test prediction. And that's going to equal model dot predict test x. And I didn't create the plot function yet. So we're going to add a to do here to do or before we add the to do, I'm going to create a comment called plot. And if plot is active, or if plot is set to true, which by default, it is not, we're going to show a plot. So we're going to first create an error here. So we're going to raise not implemented error that says plot function has not been created yet. And this is a great practice to use when you have functionality that has not been created yet. Because if you just type in something such as pass, and you call this later on when your project gets bigger and bigger, you might not understand why you're not getting a response. Anytime you don't have functionality, return something that is very descriptive. A not implemented error is going to really help you debug later. So I strongly encourage you to always use not implemented error over pass. But we will create that in just a moment. Let's just finish this function. So at the end, we want to return the data. So here we can type in return a prediction. And the prediction is going to have some interesting values. First, the value of the prediction is going to be the y prediction at the index of zero at the index of zero. Because right now we are two layers deep or two levels deep in the list, which means we need to get out of those two levels to actually get the value back, then we have an r2 score. And the r2 score is going to be the r2 score, followed by the test y and the y test prediction. So all the r2 is going to tell us is how good our data fits the linear regression model. Because in machine learning, you have many different kinds of models. And the linear regression model is only good for linear data, which means if data is going in a certain direction, linear regression will give you a general idea in which direction it is going. And it can make a prediction based on that. But if you have data that goes up and down like a roller coaster, you'll probably use something called polynomial regression. So all the R2 score does is tell us how good our data fits the linear regression model. If it's a high score, it means our data is rather reliable. Otherwise, it's going to tell us that it didn't really make any good predictions. So that's actually what the R2 score does. It's not entirely just the accuracy of the prediction. It's more about how our data fits the linear regression model in other words. 
Anyway, next we have a slope and the slope is exactly what it sounds like. So model dot coefficient and here we'll get that at the index of zero at the index of zero. So if year one, we have 50 and year two, we have 100 and year three, we have 150. The slope is obviously going to be 50 and that's what it's returning to us. So it's good to have that if we want to use it. Then we also want to define the intercept, which will be the model dot intercept at the index of zero. And that just tells us where the line crosses over the y axis. And we can also have the mean absolute error. So mean absolute error is going to be the mean absolute error of test y and y test prediction. And the mean absolute error is just going to give back to us a solid number that says, okay, our calculation is probably going to be off by 50. So it's going to be plus minus 50 of whatever the prediction is. So we have the prediction function down. All that's left to do is to create the plot and also to just insert some information to make a prediction. So we're going to create a function called display plot, and it's going to take some inputs of type list of floats and the outputs of type list of float. And we also need to provide a Y line. Then we can call plt dot scatter, and we need to scatter the inputs and the outputs. Then we're going to set the size to 12. The plt dot X label is going to be equal to inputs. And the Y label is going to be equal to outputs. Then plt dot plot the inputs with the Y line. And we're going to set the color of that to red. We want the line to be red. And finally, we want to show this plot. So plt dot show. And that's usually the biggest mistake I make is to forget calling dot show. And then I never understand why the plot doesn't show. So always remember to call plt dot show. Now, instead of having this not implemented error, we can now replace that with display the plot and the inputs are going to be set to X. The outputs are going to be set to lowercase y and the y line is obviously going to be equal to the y line. So now we have a way of plotting the data or showing the plotted data if we want to. All that's left to do is to test out our prediction function. So if name is equal to main, we're going to create some sample data. So in this case, I'm going to create some years of list of type integer. So here we're going to have the first year, second year, third year, fourth year, fifth year, sixth year, seventh year, eighth year, ninth year, and 10th year. So 10 years of data. In general, the more data you have to feed the model, the better. 10 is a good starting point, but I would not limit it to that. And because you already get what I'm trying to do here, I'm going to paste in the earnings. So for the first year, I have 1,000. For the second year, I have 800. And for the 10th year, I have 4,800. So we have some sort of growing number that's correlated to the amount of years. And we want to guess what happens based on an input we provided. So my input, for example, of type integer is going to equal 20. We want to see what this will be like in 20 years. So just like that, we can type in prediction of type prediction is going to equal make prediction and the input or the inputs is going to be set to the years, the outputs, are going to be set to the earnings. The input value is going to be set to my inputs. And we're not going to print or show the plot just yet. We're just going to test that everything works. Then we can print that my input was my input. And we want to print the prediction. What did we get back from that prediction? So just like that, we can run this script and it might take a bit of time the first time, depending on how strong your computer is. And it's going to spit out to us this prediction. As you can see, we got 9875 in 20 years, which looks about right because 4,800 times two would be around 9,600. So it looks like it's following the pattern quite nicely. As soon as you have numbers that start to simulate a roller coaster, such as if you enter 10,000 here and let's say zero here, you'll see that this percentage is going to drop drastically because the data is not going to fit the model as well. It's not going to know why this went up to 10,000 or why this went to zero. It's going to be a bit more confusing. So the more linear the data is, the better. And a better way to show this is actually just to display the plot. So we'll just set plot to true. 
So right here, if we run the program with plot set to true, we will get our plot back with the line prediction that tells us in which direction we are going. But as you can see, this is linear. The dots are going in a certain direction. As soon as we start doing something funky, such as saying this is 3000, this is 2000, and this is 1000, we're going to create an arch. And if we create an arch, we're going to have a line that doesn't represent our data that well. Something better would be an arch that goes up and down. So the linear regression model does not really work here that well. And as soon as we close this and go back, you'll see that we don't really get that good of a prediction. It's just the wrong model. It even gave us an R2 score of 0%, which is awful. So linear regression is one of the first models you will learn about when you're learning machine learning. And what you really need to know is just that it has to be going in a certain direction for it to actually make sense to use it. But one more thing I'm going to show you that you can do because we have prediction data, we can also guess what's going to happen in 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, all at the same time. So for example, we can print something such as year 30, and here we'll type in prediction dot slope times 30. I'll do 40 and 50 as well. 40 years and 50. So now if we run this script, but first I'll set plot to false, you'll see that first we'll get the prediction for 20 years, but we'll also get a prediction for 30, 40, and 50 years, roughly. So there's a lot of cool stuff you can do with this prediction if you want to get a general idea of what the future value is going to be. And I also want to show you one more thing. So print, let's say prediction dot mean absolute error. Every time you print this, it's going to tell you that the value is going to be plus minus 325. The prediction is going to be 9,875, but that might be plus 325 or that might be minus 325. This is how far off it might be. But anyways, I hope you enjoyed your first lesson in machine learning. We created a very cool value prediction script. Now it's up to you to play around with it, add your own data, maybe take it from a CSV file, and just make some cool predictions. I'm gonna show you how to become a millionaire. All you need is to have one thing that you can get $10 for. I don't care if it's cutting hair, cutting grass, painting, babysitting, just get somebody to give you $10. All I want you to do is do it 10 more times. That's all. You have $100. I want you to do it 10 more times. You're gonna have $1,000. What I want you to do is do it 10 more times. You'll now have $10,000. Whatever you did to make the 10,000, do it 10 more times. You're gonna have $100,000. Here's the trick of tricks. Once you make $100,000, you're gonna have to hire a few people. Same thing you did to make the 100,000. I just want you to do it 10 more times. Congratulations. You are a millionaire. Let's create a Telegram chatbot. And the first thing you have to do is actually open up Telegram and go to your search bar and search for botfather. It should be this one here that says at botfather with the verified arrow. The other ones are fake. So make sure you tap on the correct one and tap on start because botfather will help us set up a bot that we can use on Telegram. And as soon as you start botfather, it's going to give you a lot of useful documentation. And what we care about at the moment is creating a new bot. So how would you like to call your new bot? Give your new bot a name. And I'm going to call it Luigi. And then you need to create a username and that username must end in bot. So here we'll call it cool underscore ABC underscore bot. And if you can successfully use that name because some names are taken, it will give you this congratulations message along with your token. And you're going to want to save this token. So copy that, create a new Python project and create a constant called token, which of course will be of type final of type string. And that's going to equal the token that you have for your Telegram bot. My token is not going to work for you and I am going to delete it as soon as I'm done recording. So make sure you have your own token and that you keep it safe because anyone that knows this token can play around with your chatbot. And while we are already here, we're going to also create another constant called bot username of type final of type string. 
and that's going to equal at your bot username. So for me, it's going to be cool underscore ABC underscore bot. And this is good to have because we will use it later. But let's go back to our bot and customize it a bit more because there is a lot we can do with our bot that we've not done yet. So let's try to search for our bot. We'll type in cool ABC bot. And we should have my cool ABC bot right here. It's called Luigi. And we'll just tap on start so we can keep track of this bot. Right now, the start command does nothing. I'll show you how to set that up in a moment. But all that matters is that we now have Luigi bot here. So we can see the changes. And the first change I would like to make is giving our bot a profile picture. So if we go back to the documentation, you'll see that we can set a name, we can set description, we can set about pick, and we can set a user pick. So we're going to take care of these five. So first we'll set a user pick and we'll tap on cool ABC bot and we need to send bot for the a cool pick. So I'm going to use this one here and I'm going to send it. Now Luigi is going to have a new image and is going to look epic. But let's also set an about text and we want to do it for ABC bot and we'll give it a short description such as I am Luigi bot. I will respond to you and I'll tap on send. So that was updated. Then we should also give it a description. So uh, set description. So when people are looking at this chatbot and checking out what it can do, they're going to read this and we'll say, I can answer your messages and make your life easier dash Luigi. So we can actually hover back to Luigi and you'll see the description right here. What can this bot do? I can answer your messages and make your life easier. Each time someone tries to share Luigi bot, it will have the about text that says I am Luigi bot, I will respond to you. So we're slowly filling out the fields for this bot. There's only two more fields we need to work with. One is set commands and one is set join groups. So we'll start with set join groups because that is quite simple. We want our bot to be able to be added to groups. So we'll say that we want to enable it or by default, it is enabled. So I guess at this point, this is a good place to show you how you can disable it. We're just going to tap on enable because we're already here. But this bot can be added to groups. If you don't want that to be enabled, disable it, then we're going to set commands. So there are a few commands we need to set and one's going to be start one's going to be help and one's going to be custom. And we want to set it for cool ABC bot, and it's going to give you a way of setting it. So the first command is going to be start. And it's going to have a description of starts the bot, then we'll have one called help and help will say type something to chat with the bot. And finally, we can also add a custom one. And this will be this is a custom command. And we will tap on enter. And we can change that at any point during our program. So we don't have to worry about this being set in stone, you can change it later. But for now, we went over all the basic setup on how we want our bot to react when we are using it on Telegram. Now, if you tap on the menu, you'll see we'll have some custom commands. They don't do anything because we didn't program anything yet. But as soon as we move back to Python, we'll be able to fix that so that our bot can respond to messages that any user sends it. So let's go back to our Python project. And we don't need the sidebar, we're going to do everything inside this window. But what we do need to do is open up the terminal because we need to install a package called Python dash telegram dash bot. And with that, we can close the terminal, then let's import them. So we're going to type in from telegram, import updates. And from telegram dot extensions, we're going to import application command handler, message handler, filters, and context types. And here I'll just make a cheeky message called constants. And that will take care of the beginning of our program. Now we have all the information we need to create the functionality. So first, since everything's going to be asynchronous, we're going to have to use async def start command. And this will take care of giving the user that start command. So when they do slash start, or when some new user taps on your bot, this is going to be triggered. So first, it's going to take an update 
of type update, and it's going to take a context of type context types, which will be the default type. With that, we can type in await update dot message dot reply text. And here you can enter whatever you want to reply to the user when they use this command. So here we can say hello there, nice to meet you. Let's chat. So now this will be triggered when we use the slash start command. And the same thing is going to go for the help command and the custom command. So we're just going to copy and paste that twice and change it up a bit. So here we can type in help command and custom command. So you can do this over and over for each kind of command that you want to create. And you can also add your own functionality here. It doesn't just have to be a wait update message. You can add something such as random number equals random number. And then you can insert the random number here. So don't let this stop you from inserting your own kind of functionality. You can still do that. But here we'll type in something such as just type something and I will respond. So that will be the help command and the custom command will say this is a custom command. So those are the commands that we're going to use with our bot. Below that, we're going to create a function called handle response. And I already showed you in a previous project how to create an accurate chatbot. So you're more than welcome to put that inside this project. But for this example, we're going to create a simple chatbot, a very simple chat, and it's going to return to us a string. So the first thing we need to do in here is process the message. We're going to get whatever the user input and make it lower. So we only want to have lowercase characters to make it easier to process. Now, if hello is in the processed text, our bot is going to respond, hey there. If how are you is in the process text, we will return, I am good, thanks. And finally, we can say, if I love Python in processed, we will return Python is cool. Otherwise, if none of these trigger, we're just going to return. I do not understand. So it's a very simple chatbot. As I mentioned, we have three responses that will work here. Otherwise, it's going to say that it doesn't understand. Swap this out for your own functionality on how you want your bot to respond. Then we need to create a function that handles the message. So def handle message, and it's going to take an update of type update and the context of context types dot default type. The first thing we want to get inside here is the message type, whether it's of type group or of type private. So message type, and that's going to be equal to update message dot chat dot type. Then we want to get the text. So text of type string will equal the update dot message dot text. So we can see what the user actually said. And to log this information, we'll just type in log. We're going to print that the user and the user is going to have an ID. So here we'll type in update dot message dot chat dot ID in message type. And we will just insert the text here. So we can see exactly what the user said. Then we want to make sure that a chatbot in a group only responds when it gets mentioned, because if it responds to everyone, it gets quite annoying that it keeps on cutting people off. So in a group, it's a good idea to make it only respond if it is mentioned. Otherwise, in a private chat, it should respond directly. So if the message type is equal to the group, and if the bot username is in the text, so that's going to act as the mention, then we're going to type in new text It's going to equal a string of text, replace, and we want to get rid of the bot username from the text that the user has inserted, so that we can actually process it correct. So we're going to replace the bot username with nothing. And we're going to call dot strip and dot strip is going to remove any trailing or leading white spaces, then the response of type string is going to equal handle response with the new text else, we're just going to return because if you are in a group chat, and you don't mention the bot, you don't want it to respond. So you just return out of this on the outer if statement, we're just going to type in response of type string is going to equal handle response of whatever text the user has inserted. So in both cases, we're going to handle the response. The only difference is that in a group, we're going to have this new text that we had to clean up because we also want to make sure that we mention it directly. So here we can type in 
handle message type and at the bottom we're going to reply so reply and that's going to be a print statement that says bot with the response so that again is used for logging and we will type in await update dot message dot reply text and that's going to be the response below that we need to create an error handler so async def error that's going to take an update of type update and a context that will actually be used in this scenario, which will take the context types dot default type. And we will print that the update update caused error and we will add the context dot error. And that's all this is going to do. It's just going to log whatever error happens. Now we can finally glue all of this together. So I'm going to create a function called main and in here, we're going to first print that we are starting up the bot. And I always like to have these intro messages in the script just to make sure that it's actually starting. Then we're going to create an app, which is going to be an application dot builder that takes the token of type token and that builds it. So dot build. And we're going to first start with the commands. So I created a comment called commands and inside we're going to call app dot add handler and it's going to be a command handler, which is going to take the command name such as start. And that's going to trigger the start command without the parentheses. We're going to duplicate that two times, change this to help and change this to custom. But of course, remember to change both of the commands to their respective command names, such as help command and custom command. To handle the messages, we need to create a different kind of handler. So app.addHandler and this one will take a message handler. The message handler will take filters.text and it's going to handle the message. Then for errors, we're going to add an error handler. So add error handler. And we're just going to add the error. Then we need to print polling. And polling just means that we're checking for messages every X amount of seconds. App.run polling. And I'm going to set that to five settings. So poll interval will be set to five. You can put that as a lower number or as a higher number. It just means that the bot is going to wait or it's going to check every five seconds for new messages. So it might just not respond immediately. And finally, all that's left to do is to type in if name is equal to main and run main. If we actually decide to run this this time, it's going to start up the bot and then it's going to say polling if everything goes well. If we go back to our bot and this time we're actually going to delete the chat or how do we, yeah, we're just going to delete this chat and we're going to search for our bot again, which was called cool underscore ABC underscore bot. Once we find Luigi and we tap on start, it's going to be able to actually respond to us, which means now our bot is finally live. Then we can type something such as hello and the bot can respond to the messages we wrote. If we write something completely random, it's not going to be able to understand that, but I can say I love Python and it's going to respond exactly what we wrote in our handle response function. We can go to the menu and use the commands. As I mentioned earlier, if you do slash help, it will have some sort of help message for you. If you do slash custom, it will give you the custom command. So that's super cool. We made it work in a private chat. Anyone can access this bot now and they can play around with it. But let's see how we can use it in a group. So for this example, I actually created a group called my group and we're going to want to add Luigi to this group. So we're going to have to click on the triple dots, click on view group info, and we're going to want to add a new user or the member is going to be my Luigi bot. So cool underscore ABC underscore bot. So we'll add Luigi, add. And we are sure, so we will add LuigiBot. Now LuigiBot is part of this, but you'll notice something very interesting. And that is that if we talk to LuigiBot and say, hello, he's not going to respond. You need to set permissions for your bot if you wanted to actually be able to respond. So go to manage group, go to administrators, and you want to add an administrator. And then LuigiBot will get these permissions. So we will just tap on save, and as soon as we have LuigiBot as an administrator and save, LuigiBot is going to be able to respond to our messages. So 
hello. And as you saw, it was able to respond to the messages, but it doesn't respond to messages if we don't mention it. How are you at LuigiBot? And LuigiBot will respond to our messages. So now we have LuigiBot that works in a group and that works in private. So that was the entire script. And you can also notice that in the logs, we have a lot of stuff going on, such as my user ID in the group and my user ID in private and what the bot responded to certain messages. So there's a lot of cool stuff that you can play around with in this project, add your own kind of functionality, experiment with it because Telegram bots are really cool. One last thing to mention is that as soon as you stop this script, the bot is not going to be able to respond because the script must be running for the bot to actually be able to respond. And if you want to host a Telegram bot, you're going to have to look online for hosting services for Python script hosting services. And that's one way that you can run your bot 24 seven, otherwise buy a very cheap computer and just run this script nonstop. Congratulations on making it to the end of this course. Now, this is not the end of learning Python. There are still thousands of projects you're going to have to go through to become a true professional when it comes to programming with Python. This course covered a lot of cool projects and I highly encourage you to start building your own projects. Think of something cool to make. It could be a messaging app. It could be a Bluetooth app. Do some research on Google, look at some YouTube tutorials and continue expanding your skills. Practice is the only way you're going to perfect the Python language. And one more thing, I'm going to be adding new Python projects to this course every now and then. So feel free to come back to this course to see what's new. Otherwise, congratulations again on finishing this course, and I hope you'll enjoy your new Python skills.